thank everybody on the on the city staff team who has uh, put together a very extensive report to help us better understand the challenges we face with energy resilience, um, particularly with recent developments uh, in regulatory developments, issues with PG&E um, and with the PUC. I uh, really want to thank uh, Ray Reardon uh, and Lori Mitchell for all your work on this and your teams. I know this is uh, no small amount of work and meetings have been going on weekly uh, throughout the last several months as we've learned of these challenges. Um, thanks, Jim Warpal, for all your efforts uh, coordinating all this. Uh, Matt Kino and Public Works and Walter Lynn, who's here. Um, Bennett Chang uh, and her team have been working very hard uh, with our partners in Sacramento. And speaking of our partners in Sacramento, I want to thank Senator Hill for hosting a subcommittee hearing on de-energization and the impacts. And we had staff there. I was testifying as well. And we were, uh, I think it was interesting to hear what I'm told after I testified, there were a lot of horror stories about communication and issues with regard to de-energization, something we all need to be very aware of. Um, you know, I think Senator Weiner, I know, has been a great champion for uh, for cities in addressing some of these issues. Um, it is certainly a great concern to me uh, what's happened in recent months. I know that we have dodged the bullet so far this summer on any significant de-energization events, but I think we all know uh, if we did have one and it was extended in time, uh, it would create very severe challenges for us uh, and certainly cost lives and pose safety risks. Mm -hmm. What I think we're all also concerned about is energy resilience going forward with everything that we're knowing, we're learning about uh, climate change and the changing markets. Uh, we have a lot to, to be focused on with regard to energy resilience, uh, whether we have a de-energization or not. So thanks to everyone for the hard work. Uh, Jim, take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Mayor. Good morning, uh, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Jim Orpal, Deputy City Manager, and joining me in this presentation today is Ray Reardon, our Director of Emergency Management, Lori Mitchell, our Director of Community Energy, and Walter Lynn, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, we're here today to engage the Council on a critical and timely topic, energy resilience. It's a broad and complex topic. It requires pretty deep understanding to pursue the right policy and program choices to secure our energy future. And we need to do this really in a smart, effective, and efficient way. And what we're going to describe to you uh, this morning is really kind of lay out the short-term issues around the PG&E public safety power shutdown issues, as well as kind of medium and long-term issues around securing our energy future. The study session came about based upon direction that we received in a memorandum from the Mayor, Vice Mayor Jones, and Council Members Jimenez, Perales, and Foley. The Rules Committee took this up in June and directed that we have the study session at the earliest opportunity the Council could convene on it. There was a significant amount of work that this team and many others across the city did to prepare for this study session. And then on June 25th, the Community Energy Department brought forward to the Council a series of principles on how we approach kind of electric reliability and sustainability into the future. And so with those two points of direction, we have the study session for you today. In terms of outlining what we're going to do today, um, we have kind of a series of uh, elements to this study session. Ray is going to begin and lay out kind of the energy availability threat assessment. Again, that focuses on the PG&E public safety power shutdown potential. Uh, he'll go through the preparations that we've done as a city in the event that does occur uh, and, and the considerations and the potential impacts that that could have to our city. Lori will take up local control analysis that will focus a lot on both private utility versus public utility um, uh, characteristics, benefits uh, of, of the various approaches to that. Um, we'll move on to grid resiliency. Lori will also kind of describe that and kind of how the grid system works throughout the state and locally. Walter will then focus in on how it affects us directly in the city and our significant efforts at preparing kind of backup power generation at our critical city facilities, things that we need to keep running uh, regardless of what happens to the overall grid, our police and public safety, fire, uh, airport, regional wastewater facility, uh, sanitary sewer system, all those types of things. We've done significant work 
to ensure that those facilities will stay operational in the event of a public safety power shutdown. And then we'll conclude with Lori laying out what it would take to consider municipalizing any of our electric system and the steps involved in that process. So we have a pretty extensive presentation, probably about an hour, and we uh, asked the council's patience on that to kind of get through the whole thing because we think some questions that might arise early in the presentation could be answered later on, and we think that might be the best use of time, uh, but that will still leave plenty of time for council questions, discussion, and public comment on the topic as well. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ray, and he'll uh, begin. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, council members, Mr. City Manager, staff, and members of the public that are attending today's uh, study session. I am Ray Reardon, the Director of the City Manager's Office of Emergency Management. As is described by Jim, I'll be covering the current threat assessment of, uh, of our power sources as PG&E has been given the authority to conduct public safety power shutoffs. Uh, as I describe the threat posed by the power shutoff program, I need you to understand the difference between distribution and transmission. Today, you enjoy the ability to walk into your home or your office and turn on the light switch. The power provided to your home or to your businesses uh, are provided to you through the parts called distribution power systems. It is the lower voltage lines that deliver use, usable consumer power to homes and businesses. The transmission section I'll talk about in a little bit of the power grid is the higher voltage lines that run for miles over hilltops and across valleys that brings the power to the distribution. The amount of voltage in these lines are much higher and the infrastructure much larger as well as older. Due to the risk uh, and devastation we saw last year's camp fire and fires prior to that, the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, authorized PG&E to conduct power shutoffs to reduce the threat of igniting wildfires during forecasted high heat temperatures, low humidity, dry vegetation, and windy conditions. The term used by the National Weather Service for these kinds of weather in engagements is red flag weather warnings or alerts. To give you a sense of frequency of what we might expect, last year the Santa Clara Valley experienced two red flag events uh, on the Eastern Hills or the Diablo Range and four on the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, this is important to understand because those are the two areas our transmission crosses. PG&E has produced some historical data that they have not yet shared with us in terms of how this would be uh, actuated as a public shutoff. The areas that will be targeted for the power shutoffs are in the areas where homes have been built into the dense forest-like vegetation, or what's also called the vegetation wildland intermix. The denser the vegetation, the steeper the terrain, the higher the threat in this, what they call the high fire threat districts. For San Jose, it means uh, in that top right diagram, the yellow shaded areas around San Jose are in what's known as a tier two. Uh, and the rust color is the higher threat or tier three threat. The distribution shutoffs will be localized and more controlled in those yellow and rust color areas around the city of San Jose. The transmission lines that serve San Jose run through, also run through high fire threat districts. In this diagram, the red line running through uh, the yellow from the top right Livermore into the South San Jose area is one of four transmission lines that are easily seen in this map. And from the south, a high voltage line from Moss Landing serves the Metcalf power substation in the south, so it crosses that rust color and yellow color from the bottom left into the center of the south part of San Jose. Please notice how these lines cross through tier two and three, or high threat and severe threat zones. These could be shut off because of the threat of a wildland fire or an actual fire. But what, we must, must, but what we must also understand is that these transmission lines coming from Livermore actually gets its power from a much further distance, relying on other transmission lines that could be as far away as the power sources in the Sierras or even as far north as the Oregon border. Threats to transmission lines far away 
can impact us locally. The potential threat could turn power off to some or portions of the city or the entire city. Of most concern is what, we, what is known as a cascading failure. This is when one transmission line shut off could cause failure in the next transmission line and so on, a cascading effect. PG&E in their wildfire safety plan submitted to the CPUC states that the transmission lines far away from, the, in the, uh, from high fire threats locally could still de-energize San Francisco or San Jose. This is in an actual written document. Since we learned about this potential, we have been meeting with PG&E, CalISO, and many other organizations to make sure that we are prepared. We've participated in four workshops with PG&E, including one that directly involves city staff and PG&E in a dialogue, a tabletop exercise. We participated in the PG&E wild, uh, wildfire open houses. We've conducted a self-assessment of critical facilities and power generation needs. We submitted to PG&E the list of city critical facilities and power generation needs. We've developed a power vulnerability plan that will be useful not just during a power shutoff, but also during or following an earthquake when power would be naturally turned off. We've created a crisis communications plan for managing preparedness <laughs> information and communicating with the public during a power shutoff. We've conducted three additional tabletop exercises to explore city response and communications uh, with the public. Weekly, we've held meetings with city leadership on the issues uh, in various departments to make sure we're planning ahead. We've met with the California Independent System Operator, the CPUC reps, to understand the means and methods of response and better coordination. We've met with the California Office of Emergency Services and other response partners to ensure our coordination. We've attended legislative hearings. And I want to take the time to thank all the staff who've reprioritized their work to commit to the development of the power uh, vulnerability plan and the issues that we're facing with this. Uh, what typically will take six to 18 months to put together an emergency plan is we put the efforts and resources together in 10 weeks. Significant effort by city staff, very much appreciated. Life safety impacts. The city has taken this threat so seriously because the potential impact of a cascading power outage has been demonstrated in other events. For example, in 2003, a blackout that affected the United States and Canada resulted in over 100 deaths. We are most concerned about those uh, of our vulnerable populations. We could see such situations as wheelchairs running out of power, devices that, that people rely on for medical support could be impacted and, and run dry of power. Currently, there's over 7,300 people registered in what's known as a medical baseline with PG&E, but we're sure there are more uh, than that it, that would rely on power uh, for their medical devices. Other conditions and situations is there could be, uh, the hospitals could be compromised and uh, operations and other things uh, delayed. Senior and other care facilities are def definitely vulnerable to the power outages, as are the, our mobile home park areas. Additional life safety impacts. Uh, our tri uh, traffic light system does not have battery backup at each intersection, so we could expect gridlock in terms of uh, traffic on the streets. Security and video surveillance systems would be affected. Refrigeration for medicine, baby food, this normal household refrigeration would be out. Limited communications would be experienced on cell towers, internet access, and other phone charging capabilities. So the primary method that most people have today for communicating would be compromised. Our critical facilities also would be strained because they're relying on ba backup power. And at these facilities, the backup power does not power everything. It only powers life safety support and some dedicated circuits, so it's not the entire facility. And of course, most of these conditions will happen during high heat conditions, so we ha could have medical issues for those who would be suffering during the heat, especially without air conditioning uh, available because the power is out. And then, of course, air quality issues would arise as well. The CPUC recognized that the power shutoffs would have significant impacts and required in their May 30 decision that 
the electric investor owned utilities must help critical facility and critical infrastructure representatives assess the need for backup generation and determine whether additional equipment is needed. This would include the provision of generators to facilities or infrastructure that are not well prepared or insufficiently prepared for a power shutoff. Up to this day, PG&E has not yet agreed to provide required backup generators to what we are identifying as cooling centers or other critical facilities that wouldn't have backup power. The impact goes further. The outage would go beyond the physical impacts of the threat that I just reviewed. It would also have an economic impact in terms of lost productivity in uh, the, the businesses in the area, commodity spoilage. It creates a whole new debris management issue with the amount of foods that would be spoiled. Uh, supply chain disruptions, the traffic impact uh, would also disrupt the ability to deliver groceries and other uh, necessary supplies and needs. Uh, we'd have significant costs to local uh, municipalities for the overtime and costs to respond to this, medical costs, et cetera. These kinds of issues and items that we're discussing have been backed up by looking at some historical data. Uh, first, I want to recognize that PG&E has promoted a very large and deep public education campaign that encourages residents to prepare for a power outage that could last from one to seven days. So in that complication, pg e is recognizing that they could have troubles, uh, long-term issues related to a power outage because of recovery and turning the system back on. They could have power out for seven days. But when you look at these two events, one that lasted two days and one that lasted 12 hours, the economic impact in either the, the Northeast blackout, blackout or the Southwest blackout, number, millions of people were affected and millions of dollars and billions of dollars of economic impact were felt. Uh, in the Northeast area, that, that outage was caused by a tree falling against transmission lines in Ohio that blackened New York, New Jersey, uh, and Canada, Canadian areas as well as Ohio. The Southwest blackout was caused by a maintenance worker uh, operating maintenance activities on transmission line in Arizona that blocked out uh, San Diego and Orange counties. So the transmission, again, distances away, outages there could have impacts locally. And in the end, when we look at the economy of our uh, Silicon Valley uh, partners, the economic impact will be particularly high in the tech dominant Bay Area. These graphics focus on the data, data center losses per minute. So looking at the median costs in 2010 from $5,000 a minute to $7,000 in 2016, and the mean average of $5,600 uh, in 2010 to now almost $9,000 a minute uh, economic impact if data centers and systems are down. With that, that is my um, review of the current threat that we have, and I'll be turning it now over to Lori Mitchell for the next section. Thank you, Ray. I'm Lori Mitchell, and I'm the Director of Community Energy. And now I'll go over some local control analysis that we have done and uh, start to explain um, the different services of how we get electricity. So as Ray said, there's three main components to how we all get electricity service. So there's generation, and here in San Jose, San Jose Clean Energy provides generation service for 90. 8% of our residents, um, and then PG&E provides the rest of that service. On transmission lines, PG&E owns and maintains many transmission lines in California, so do the other investor-owned utilities, and the larger publicly-owned utilities also own and maintain that infrastructure. And then the California Independent System Operator is responsible for operating that system and ensuring that the system is always balanced and we have enough electricity to meet our needs. Then at the local level, there's local distribution lines. Again, these are lower voltage wires that connect homes and businesses to the larger grid. And those are owned, operated, and maintained here in San Jose by PG&E. So now I'd like to just go through some of the service differences between investor-owned utilities, CCAs, and publicly-owned utilities. 
So first, there's investor-owned utilities here in California. Those are PG&E, Southern California Edison in LA, and San Diego Gas and Electric in San Diego. So they generate, they purchase, and they sell power. They also own and maintain distribution lines. They provide their own billing service and metering, and their own customer service and call center. CCAs, as you know, but just as a reminder, what we do is we generate and we purchase and we sell when we have some excess power. We do not own or maintain distribution lines. That's a partnership with a local utility in here. That's PG&E. We also don't maintain the meters at the residents and businesses or do that meter reading and billing service. We rely on PG&E for that. Um, we do have our own customer service call center as well as PG&E has their own, so that's a shared service. And then in terms of publicly owned utilities, it, it's very much similar to the investor owned. So here in, in, in the Bay Area, we have several publicly owned utilities, Santa Clara, Palo Alto, Alameda are some examples. So they generate, they purchase, they sell their power, they often also own generation assets. Importantly, they also own and maintain their distribution lines within their jurisdiction. They provide metering services, they read all those meters and provide billing service, and they also have their own customer service and call centers. So to provide some more detail on this here in California, um, the number of CCAs now in California, there's 19 of them across the state. And there's over 40 publicly owned utilities. So they're both in the Bay Area, but also some smaller cities, uh, Redding, Healdsburg, um, in Northern California, also in Southern California, some examples are Anaheim, Burbank, um, Glendale, Riverside has a publicly owned utility. The two biggest in the state of California are Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. They provide both power and water services to LA and then Sacramento Municipal Utility District. Those are the two largest in California. And then in terms of investor-owned utilities, there's actually six, but there's three main ones, which is PG&E in Northern California, Southern California Edison, and then San Diego Gas and Electric in San Diego. In terms of generation services, CCAs now, gen now offer about 25% of all generation service in the state, so that's a significant amount of growth. POUs provide another 25%, so now more than half of the state of California on generation services is supplied either by a publicly owned utility or a CCA, which is an important change that's happened over the last few years. Um, Investor-owned utilities supply the balance of generation services about 50%. Um, it's important to recognize on the distribution services, IOUs still provide the majority of that service, so they provide 75% of those services in California, and publicly owned utilities provide another 25%. In terms of their management, um, there's some key differences. CCAs are very similar in that they're both nonprofit, they're public, they're managed either by locally elected or government appointed officials. Um, Investor-owned utilities, of course, are for-profit, they're private, their shareholder elected board appoints a management team of private sector employees. In terms of rate setting, there's also significant differences. So for CCAs, rates are set by their local governing board or city council. Um, for publicly owned utilities, that's also the same, that their rates are set by their local governing board or their city council. But for investor-owned utilities, their rates are set by the California Public Utilities Commission. In terms of the agency that regulates these different models, CCAs are regulated both by the California Energy Commission and the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, it's important to note that publicly owned utilities are regulated by the California Energy Commission, not the CPUC, which is primarily an economic regulator for the investor-owned utilities. Some other key difference in terms of financing, so for CCAs, typically low interest loans are provided from the member communities to fund the startup. Um, they also take on uh, low interest loans from financial institutions here in San Jose. We have that from Barclays. Um, for publicly owned utilities, they typically have tax-free bonds and low interest loans to support their operations. 
However, investor-owned utilities have stockholders, and they sell bonds and borrow from banks at typically higher rates. So you can see in terms of the rate of return for PG&E right now, their authorized rate of return is 10.25%. However, they are requesting an increase in this rate of return to 14%, um, in particular to deal with their challenges around wildfires. In terms of profit and net revenue, CCAs and POUs are very similar and that rates are set to primarily to recover costs. They're also set to return additional revenue to invest in new facilities um, for CCAs, that's generation, or to fund local programs and projects. The same is true for publicly owned utilities. Their rates are set to recover their costs and then to add an additional return to maintain their bond ratings and invest in new infrastructure. For investor-owned utilities, there's a key difference in that their rates are, are also set to recover costs, but they're in additionally set to return a profit to their investor-owned shareholders. In terms of public power, it's important to note that nationwide it's more reliable. So on average, public power customers across uh, the U.S. experience just under an hour um, without power versus investor-owned are over two hours. And then in terms of cost, there's also some key differences. So in California, on average, publicly owned utilities, their residential rates are 17.4% lower and their commercial rates are 14.7% lower, but it's important to note that there's, there's huge variation among different utilities, but across the board, they are typically much lower. So here, um, you know, a good example is Silicon Valley Power that's operated by Santa Clara. Their residential rates are 48% lower than PG&E's, which is significant. Um, and then their non-residential commercial rates are 26 to 38% lower. SMUD that operates in Sacramento, one of the largest utilities here in Northern California, their residential rates are 33% lower and their commercial rates are 31 to 47.6% lower. And even a small uh, electric utility, Alameda Municipal Power, which is here in the Bay Area, they offer residential rates that are 14.9 to 31% lower and non-residential rates that are 11 to 18.9% lower. And then finally, you have Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. They're the largest publicly owned utility in California. Their residential rates are 31% lower and their non-residential rates are seven to 27% lower. So you might wonder, how is power, public power less expensive? How does that, this happen? Well, there's some key differences. One, municipalities have a lower ca cost of capital. They can leverage tax-exempt debt to finance infrastructure. It's important to know they don't pay dividends. They often have much lower executive pay. And then effective public oversight can create pressure for cost efficiencies. In terms of energy affordability and equity, it's important to note that nationwide, one in three households in the U.S. faces challenges in terms of paying their electricity bill. So the graph here shows that on average, um, households that report any household energy security is well over 30%. And, and how that works in terms of real examples, um, over 20% of households nationwide forego basic necessities to pay their electric bill. Almost 15% have received a disconnect notice where they would be disconnected for their local utility and they wouldn't have electricity. And over 10% keep their home at an unhealthy or unsafe temperature. And it's important to note these, these bars show that these, ha these things occur you know, either almost every month, in some months, or one or two months of the year. So we know that the financial resources for many households will limit their ability to prepare for and recover from a power loss because many people are already struggling to pay their electric bills. In terms of here in San Jose, it's really important to note that we know that approximately 300,000 to 400,000 San Jose residents are low income and they're economically vulnerable to a significant public safety power shutoff event. So here in San Jose, we have over 20% of households that qualify for the CARE program where they receive a 30% discount on their electricity bill. But we know there's many residents that still qualify as low income. However, there are no discounts available. So that's another 15 to 20% 
of households here in San Jose. And over time, this is something that we hope to address on the, the generation side with San Jose Clean Energy, but it will be co a continuing challenge on the distribution side. In terms of affordability and equity challenges, there's many uh, issues to think about. One is just the cost of spoiled food or medicine is going to be much more challenging for our low-income residents. They're much more uh, less likely to be able to afford backup generation. We know that communications during a public safety power shutoff event will be harder for non-English speaking residents. And then we know that our disabled populations are especially vulnerable. There's many people that have mobility issues and depend on electric wheelchairs and chairlifts and elevators. And then finally, a lack of public transit will also exacerbate these issues. And this is a photo for some stakeholders that testified in Sacramento a few weeks ago of their concerns um, related to their mobility issues. So next I'll talk a little bit about grid resiliency and some of the things that we can do to address these challenges. So first I wanna you know, reiterate there's different solutions for different components of the electrical system. So again, transmission lines, as re reiterated, but I'll reiterate again, are these high voltage wires that carry power across the large areas across California. Um, distribution lines, again, are lower voltage and they connect homes and businesses to the electrical grid. And then on site, you can often locate uh, solar and storage on a particular building, either on a home or a business. And so we'll talk about different options for each of these components. So first, I, I thought we would start out with a definition of resiliency because I think a lot of people have different ideas about what that means. But the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission offers an understanding of resilience to mean the ability to withstand and reduce the magnitude and or duration of disruptive events, which includes the capability to anticipate, absorb, adapt to, and or rapidly recover from such an event. And of course, these are pictures from the campfire last year. There's pictures of the wire and the transmission lines that caused that fire. And then here locally in the Bay Area, the very poor air quality that we experienced. So in terms of on-site backup infrastructure that can help us in these types of events, there's three primary um, technologies that we can look at. The first one is generators. This is by far the most commonly um, used solution right now. However, one drawback to it is that it does burn fuel to generate electricity. So often generators are run on diesel or they're run on natural gas, so they do produce emissions. Um, another technology that could help are fuel cells. So fuel cells convert natural gas or hydrogen into electricity. Um, it's important to note that a natural gas fuel cell does produce emissions and those emissions are often much higher than the grid electricity. And then finally, there's solar paired with battery storage. So this is becoming a more common solution, particularly as these technologies have become more economic. There's also additional benefits to this technology in that it can help customers reduce their utility costs even when there isn't a power outage and provide additional revenue streams for customers. And then of course, it can also help us meet our sustainability goals. So in terms of distribution level infrastructure, I thought it'd be helpful to provide a couple real pictures of what we're talking about. So here, the, the first picture up there is a substation. You know, often people drive past these and they think that's a power plant or something else, but what this is is a substation. And what a substation does is it lowers the voltage from the transmission lines to the distribution lines. So there's transformers there that receive the power from the transmission line and then it's converted into lower voltage electricity to connect our homes and businesses. Here in San Jose, we have many of these substations and they're a critical component to how we get reliable electricity service. And then the bottom picture is what most people are pretty familiar with, is there are the distribution poles that connect to our homes and our businesses. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about distribution level infrastructure. It's important to note that microgrids are sections of distribution infrastructure that can island. And when I mean island, this means that they can continue to operate when the grid loses power. So usually they're able to do this because there's on-site um, energy generation within the microgrid. So this could be solar, could be wind, could be a combined heat and power plant, and it could be energy storage. It's also important to note that only utilities can operate distribution infrastructure to serve customers when that infrastructure crosses a public right-of-way. 
In terms of transmission level infrastructure, this is a map of all the transmission lines across California. You can see that they <coughs> span quite vast areas. The red lines are transmission lo lines that are owned and maintained by PG&E. So you can see they own lines that go all the way up to the California-Oregon border. Um, those blue lines in Southern California are owned by Southern California Edison. And then you can see some of the red lines at the bottom are San Diego, Gas and Electric. A little harder to see, but down in Southern California, there's some green lines. Those are owned and operated by Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. There's also some pink lines that are a little harder to, to see, but they're up near Sacramento where um, SMUD also owns and operates some transmission lines. So of course, um, they are primarily owned by the investor-owned utilities. They allow power to travel over large service territories, and PG&E does have the largest network in California. Um, but it's important to note that the California oh, Independent System Operator is actually the entity that is responsible for operating all of these transmission lines. And it's really important to note that they do not own them and they do not maintain them. So they don't know necessarily the status of the infrastructure, but they do operate. So what the all owners of transmission have to do, if there's an outage, they have to submit that to the California Independent System Operator and then engineers at the California Independent System Operator have to model how are we gonna still have reliable power across the state and rebalance the system to be able to do that. So the, the California Independent System Operator is currently studying the transmission infrastructure and evaluating options during certain public safety power shutoff scenarios. We have been working very closely with them to let them know what our critical facilities are and, and to let them know our concerns, particularly as they relate to those cascading outages that Ray talked about earlier. In terms of battery storage, I thought it was also pretty important to provide some real pictures of what are we talking about when we talk about battery storage. So the, the first picture is a typical home unit. So these are images of a battery storage unit that could be installed at a residence or a home. You can see it looks like an electrical panel that's just mounted on the wall. Um, and then battery storage can also be installed in a, in a very large way to be paired with a utility scale power plant. And so the pictures at the bottom are, some ren are renderings of what that might look like, where there are large containers of electrical infrastructure, often paired with solar or wind um, to provide additional um, generation in the hours where those resources are not generating. Now we have a quick video, and I'm hoping it'll work. Many of you might have heard of the duck curve, but I thought it would be important to, to learn a little bit more about Today, that. we're going to talk about the grid and a duck. An odd combination, but they actually do go together. This graph shows the hourly electric load on a spring day in California. It's the lowest at night when people are asleep. It starts rising as people wake up and peaks around noon then tapers off starting around 6 p.m. Utilities balance this variable demand by ramping up and ramping down power plants to control their output. For decades, these patterns have remained relatively predictable. As more homes, businesses, and utilities go solar, these patterns are changing. Here is the same chart, but with some of the demand met by solar. The rest of the demand needs to be met by traditional power plants. As solar meets more demand during the day, it means less conventional energy is needed. But as solar production goes down at night, conventional energy needs to ramp up quickly to meet evening demand. This balancing act between energy supply and demand can waste some of the solar energy that's being generated. If solar generates too much power, utilities need to manage the oversupply on the market they can decide to curtail solar production, which means they do not use some of the power that is generated. Fortunately, this only happens a handful of times every year and only in a few areas like California, where solar generates significant amounts of the utility's energy supply. So, what can be done to help address these issues? First, we can increase the flexibility of generation by adding diverse energy sources increasing the geographic area in which we can balance power supply on the grid, and developing better prediction technologies. 
Second, pricing can be structured to incentivize consumers to use less energy in the evening, which would help reduce the ramping requirement as the sun goes down. And third, we can shift PV generation to the evening by storing power generated by solar earlier in the day. As we look to a future with exponentially higher amounts of solar energy connected to the grid, these strategies could enable the electricity system to use all the electricity generated from solar with more cushion for utilities to meet the evening load. So, that's how we're going to solve this tricky problem with the duck. Right now, these challenges are only faced in areas like California and Hawaii, where there's a lot of solar. But, with help from the SunShot Initiative, these lessons learned can be replicated across the country as more states tackle the same challenges and solar becomes a greater part of our energy next slide see more images of the deduct there we go <laughs> so hopefully that was somewhat informative some people sometimes ask me what this duck curve is and so I thought it was helpful to provide a little background but essentially you know in, in California as the video stated we're facing um, which is a great uh, achievement a lot of penetration of solar energy on the grid but it's important how we manage that electricity to in, ensure that we can still meet nighttime demands. So these are really where energy storage does come in. So this is a picture of a utility scale storage plant um, for San Jose Clean Energy. We just signed our first long-term contract to start to build this type of storage and, and pair it with solar energy. We signed a, a 10 megawatt contract recently. And so that's one example of how utilities are, are starting to think about this issue and really manage um, the intermittency of renewable energy. So some of the benefits of energy storage are that it improves power quality and reliability, it improves the stability and reliability of the transmission and distribution system, it can improve the availability and it increase the market value of distributed generation by just shifting the time when it's used, and then finally of course it can improve the value of renewable generation. It's important to note that, you know, that one of the main reasons that California does have so much solar now is that the cost has fallen, and you can see the, the cost of utility-scale photovoltaic, which is essentially solar energy, and, and wind has really dropped in recent years. That's very exciting. It allows us to invest in these technologies and lower our costs. Um, but impo it's important to note that the cost of battery storage is also falling, and so that's pretty exciting as well in, in terms of allowing us to economically start to invest in these technologies. Um, so since 2012, the cost of battery supply for just supplying about four hours of generation on the grid has fallen by about 76%. This is an example locally here of a new project that is fairly exciting. So in Monterey County, there is an old natural gas plant at Moss Landing. Um, and recently, CP the CPUC approved pg es proposal to build the world's largest battery solar um, system in Moss, uh, excuse me, battery storage system in Moss Landing. And so that's a very large system, well over 500 megawatts. To just put that in scale here in San Jose, our peak load is about a gigawatt, so that it would serve about half of San Jose. It's very large. Um, it's going to replace an aging natural gas plant there. Um, so this is a pretty exciting opportunity. Of course, we're interested as well in these types of opportunities. Um, we're looking at pairing storage with solar projects that we're investing in, but also looking at opportunities where we can pair storage with existing natural gas plants so they do not need to run as often as they currently do to reduce our emissions, and then also to meet our resource adequacy needs and control our costs. Again, um, I thought we'd talk a little bit about microgrids. Again, I think it's always helpful to start with a definition. A lot of people have different ideas about what a microgrid is. I also think a picture sometimes really helps here. So let's first start with a definition. So a microgrid is a group of interconnected loads with distributed energy resources. Distributed energy resources are often solar, you can think of them, or storage. They are installed in a clearly defined electrical boundary or physical boundary, and they act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. 
So a microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid. It's usually connected to the grid, which is important to note because that makes it more economic, but it can operate in both grid connected or island mode, and that's where we can get some key resiliency benefits. So you can see in this picture here, there's a lot going on, but just start from the top. So there's the distributed energy resources. You can see the solar panels and wind is an example. There's typically controllers um, and automation technology um, to allow that microgrid to always balance the electricity. There's sometimes a substation. Uh, sometimes they include a customer energy management component, and this is where the grid is telling customers to reduce or um, back off of usage, you know, that can come in the form of reducing thermostats, um, sometimes re reducing re refrigeration loads to help balance the grid. Uh, another component could be home energy storage systems. So those are those units located on a wall. They look like electrical panels that can provide um, battery storage to the community. And then sometimes they include a community energy storage. So you can see that sometimes they could also include larger utility scale generation paired with storage to help balance that grid. So lots of different examples of them and, and we'll run through here just a, a couple of benefits to it. So one, it enables grid modernization, it enables integration of smart grid technologies. They will allow for more distributed and renewable energy sources to be installed. Um, they ensure that energy supply is available for critical loads. And then finally, microgrids can support the macro grid by handling the variability of renewables locally and supplying ancillary services. And here's a photo of a microgrid up in Humboldt County. You can see there's solar paired with um, the generation on site there. In terms of funding, the California Energy Commission has given about 85 million to build 20 new microgrids across the state through the EPIC program. Um, one example here is a community college out in Dublin, Pleasanton. You can see the solar panels and um, the university campus there. Um, this project fo focuses on two use cases. One, to deploy these microgrids to ensure we have low carbon power delivery at critical facilities, and also to support the high penetration of renewables. Another example here is the Borrego Springs microgrid in San Diego. So this is a new development. It's a proof of concept test as how to information technologies and distributed energy resources, how can they increase utility assets, utilization and reliability. So it's important to note that this is a combination of utility and privately owned resources. It's a new development there that will include 125 residential storage systems paired with solar on the new development. Um, the utility will also install different technologies to enable the microgrid to island and provide reliability there in San Diego. And then next, I'll turn it over to Walter, who will talk about our own city facilities and how we can make those more resilient. Great, thank you so much, Lori. Uh, Mayor Licardo, uh, City Manager Sykes, and members of the City Council, I am Walter Lynn, the Deputy Director of Public Works. I'll be sharing with you some details about our city facilities, in particular the critical facilities that provide essential services uh, for city operations as well as services for the community. Um, those facilities that have sufficient backup generation to continue those types of essential services, as well as to describe those facilities that do not currently have enough backup generation or no backup generation at all, and the strategies that we were working through to try to ensure that we can have those services continue at those sites. Within our city facilities, we have over 400 buildings in our inventory that can be as large as the regional wastewater facility all the way down to a smaller park restroom. Of those 400 or so facilities, we've identified 129 that we deem critical uh, to provide those essential services to the community. Using the FEMA definition, a critical, city a critical facility provides services and functions essential to community, especially during and after a disaster. Examples of such facilities will be public safety service facilities, uh, police uh, facilities, fire, fire stations, emergency operation centers, shelters and evacuation sites, drinking water facilities, and wastewater treatment plants. 
the photo that you see there is a snapshot of a GIS map that we've created of the city uh, that depicts the 129 critical sites that we have within the city. Uh, it also showcases where we do have emergency backup generation and those that do not. There's an overlay also of the pg e high threat fire danger uh, areas, as well as uh, outed zones where there is uh, no power, uh, according to the pg e link that we have to this GIS map as well. For those 129 critical facilities, 97 currently do have backup generation that are diesel fueled um, generators. There are a few that are propane fueled uh, generators as well. Those sites include the uh, police and fire uh, facilities, the airport, city hall, the regional wastewater facility, our municipal water sites, corporation yards, and our radio communications, as well as many of the fire stations. Unfortunately, we do not have sufficient backup generation at 32 of those sites, which includes our 11 warming and cooling centers, five sanitary pump stations, two animal care facilities, which includes Prush Farm and Happy Hollow Zoo, and 14 of our fire stations. Those fire stations do have a small scale backup uh, power generation. It's the handheld portable generators uh, that are enough to power the apparatus bay doors and the alarm systems, but not enough to sustain the operations of the full fire stations. Uh, the listing of these sites has also been shared uh, as Ray, I've already mentioned to pg e uh, indicating that these are our critical facilities, and in particular for those 32, uh, they do not have uh, current sufficient backup generation at those sites. Staff did do a cost calculation and estimation of what it would take to bring uh, sufficient backup generation to those 32 facilities. Um, we have uh, phased them in, in terms of a smaller scale portable kit, especially for the warming centers. Uh, where a portable generator would be brought on site, uh, mobile air conditioning units, lighting towers, and also charging stations for cell phones and other critical plug load equipment. We've estimated those to be about $175,000 each. In order to provide more of the emergency services and critical uh, operations for those sites, we've estimated $1 million per site. And those would be for facilities for all lighting, uh, computer equipment, if they have kitchens and those services uh, for the community, uh, the backup generation would be at larger scale and obviously at a larger cost. With those facilities, as well as some fueling stations that we have within the city that are not currently tied to backup generation, as well as additional fueling trucks that we feel that we need, if there is an outage and it is for a sustained longer duration, we do have a priority process in place where our fueling trucks would refuel uh, the emergency backup generators uh, with the diesel fuel. However, we only have four fueling trucks in our inventory, two larger scale fueling trucks and two smaller scale ones that can only hold 100 gallons each. To put in perspective, the emergency generator here at City Hall holds 700 gallons of diesel fuel. When running at the capacity that we have it in, it will run for 17 hours or about two business days before it needs to be refueled. The largest of our fueling trucks is 1,800 gallons in capacity. So depending on how widespread the outage could be and the duration, our trucks will be out there running consistently. And there will be scenarios where we have to prioritize which sites gets the fuel first and how we refuel those sites on a, on a, on a consistent basis. From a cost estimation standpoint, in order to bring more permanent power to the sites, if we're using the portable kits, it could be um, as, as much as $5.2 million or as much as $14.3 million if we have the more permanent mounted uh, um, generators at those sites. We are looking at some aspects of uh, permanent renewable um, generation uh, for the facilities as well that would include solar energy panels as well as battery storage. Uh, those estimations are between 15 to $25 million for our uh, critical sites that do not currently have backup generation. We're trying to evaluate this as well too with the city's goal as we move towards our newer facilities being constructed in particular with the Measure T general obligation bond funding uh, support. Uh, in particular, and as an example for Fire Station 37, we are moving forward in designing that as a zero net carbon or ZNC facility. Uh, where no gas lines are actually being brought into that facility. And as Laurie shared uh, with the gas lines, uh, the emission standpoint is something that we're looking at in, in reducing uh, to electrify more of our facilities. 
With that, though, it does bring, bring more of a reliance on the electric utility. So uh, unless we have more diesel generation uh, for that backup, or looking at aspects of renewable uh, storage, uh, renewable energy and storage, um, we're going to be kind of balancing those uh, between zero net carbon and energy resiliency. Uh, with that, uh, the presentation will be brought back to Lori to talk about the municipalization of the electric utility. All right, well, thanks for sticking with us. This is the final section here, so we're almost there. Um, so just quickly, a little history of the California municipal utilities. So there's 46 across California. I mentioned some of them before, but you can see the map there of where they're located. Again, Los Angeles and Sacramento are the largest. Um, and today, 50% of total generation in California is supplied either by a publicly owned utility or a CCA. And as I shared before, publicly owned utilities consistently have lower retail rates than the investor owned utilities. Um, there's different models in terms of how uti municipal utilities are structured. There's a department model um, where often the municipal utility reports to a city council. This is how Santa Clara, Alameda, Palo Alto, many cities are operated, probably the majority. Um, the other model is where a municipal utility district serves more than one city, and they report to an independently elected board. So um, the, the best example there is SMUD in Sacramento. They serve not only the city of Sacramento, but many other cities in that region. And then in terms of municipalization, there, there's two different concepts, too, that have been tried by different cities. There's targeted municipalization, where a city will partially control some of the distribution infrastructure within a city. Typically, this is where new development is going in and new infrastructure is installed. Um, it's incremental, of course, um, and there are fewer regulatory hurdles, mainly because the infrastructure is going in new and there isn't the need to purchase assets from the incumbent investor-owned utility. And then there's full municipalization where the complete control of the infrastructure is under the city's control. In order to transition from an investor to a municipal utility, that's obviously a much longer term strategy and there are many challenges to implement that. In terms of resiliency, forming a municipal utility could provide some benefits. Um, of course, owning the distribution infrastructure increases our autonomy. There is a potential that we could mitigate against wildfire and extreme weather risks by making investments in hardening the electricity infrastructure. We could also invest in larger scale microgrids that could provide some resiliency benefits. But of course, all of this must be balanced with operational readiness. It requires appropriate staffing, um, the ability to operate and maintain the infrastructure, and provide billing and customer services. So now we'll go through some contemporary efforts at municipalization, and we'll start with SMUD. SMUD was actually the last utility in the state of California to successfully municipalize and transition from an investor-owned utility to a publicly-owned utility. Um, the citizens voted in 1923 to form this, um, so that was many years ago, and it's important to note that it took them almost over 20 years to finally get there and start operating as a municipal utility. The main pathway to own that infrastructure is eminent domain, and through those 20 years, there are many court filings, engineering studies, and political battles that, that took time um, to work through in order to allow them to successfully operate. And another important point um, that I think it's important for us to know is that during those 20 years and that process of eminent domain, PG&E had stopped investing in the, the distribution infrastructure in Sacramento. A lot of it hadn't been properly maintained. 1947, they inherited infrastructure. Some of it went back to 1895. And then they had a backlog of about 3,000 customers that were waiting for service connections. So it was a very challenging. However, today, SMUD is a very successful municipal utility. Um, in recent years, Davis um, you know, spurred an effort in the early 2000s to join SMUD. So Yolo County voted in 2006 to do that. PG&E spent over $11 million in the county to prevent that vote, and it failed by a very narrow margin. 
Um, however, of course, Davis still saw benefits, primarily because they are right next to SMA that offers significantly lower rates. And so they started to study if it was possible for them to meet a suppliers as a city. Um, PG&E was on record saying that their electric distribution facilities are not for sale. And um, they ultimately were not successful because they ended up valuing that distribution infrastructure quite differently on orders of magnitude. Um, what was a bright <laughs> spot of success is that Davis did form a CCA several years ago. That's a Valley Clean Energy. So now they are on the generation side um, seeing some local benefits from the CCA. It's important to note that currently they are working on possibly still municipalizing and engaging in the legislature in Sacramento to do that. And we are working with them as well as other cities that are considering this. Another example, of course, is San Francisco. San Francisco has a long history of trying to municipalize. So it was on the ballot in 1930, 1937, 1939, and 1941. However, it didn't pass. They did a feasibility study in the 80s that was also rejected in 2001 by a very narrow margin. A proposition to create a municipal utility district failed. Um, however, on June 5th of 2018, San Francisco voters did approve Proposition A, um, which allowed them to issue revenue bonds to invest in electric infrastructure that is needed to help them um, invest in more targeted infrastructure. And then it's important to note that today, of course, San Francisco is very much on record wanting to municipalize and um, provide an offer to buy that infrastructure as part of the bankruptcy effort. The American Public Power Association, is, which is a nationwide association um, for publicly owned utilities, does have a guideline of general steps to municipalize. That was in our staff report. I'll just quickly go through some of the initial steps. So one, there needs to be a legal evaluation and a negotiation strategy that particularly looks at the pathway for sale. So how are those assets going to be acquired? Um, I would say that's where, where we are now. And then second, once there is a viable pathway for sale and the legal issues are known, um, then a local entity needs to conduct a feasibility study to determine the value of those assets and, and what that electrical infrastructure is worth. Typically then, a, an entity will need to issue revenue bonds and those typically go to voters, so there would be a ballot measure to allow for those revenue bonds that would be paid back from the revenues related to distribution services, not, not typically the general fund. And then finally, a local entity needs to prepare for operations. So there might be construction of distribution infrastructure that needs to be installed. There might be equipment that needs to be purchased. Of course, there's, there's staff and electricians and um, other workers that would need to be hired and an organizational plan to begin operations. So finally, in terms of next steps, uh, what, we, what we see are the, the next steps from this effort is number one, to continue to advocate for funding from both PG&E and the state to provide backup generation for all of our critical facilities, and importantly, those cooling centers that Walter and Ray mentioned. We are also gonna to continue to engage in the legislature and in the governor's office for more regulatory oversight over the power safety shutdown program and to improve the viability of municipal utility options. We're also gonna evaluate options to install microgrids to improve resiliency. We're gonna to continue to incorporate storage into our resource portfolio mix, as well as develop rates and outreach to our customers to install on-site solar and batteries and reduce that even usage, improve resiliency, and advance our climate smart goals. We do plan to come back to council in the fall with rates around time of use that will incentivize some of these efforts. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you everybody for that very educational uh, presentation and I uh, really appreciate the enormous amount of work that went into that. I think typically we'd probably hire two or three consultants uh, to handle the breadth of those uh, topics and that's really was taken on by our existing staff and I know you guys are doing a lot in addition to trying to provide this kind of information and delve into these issues so so thank you for for all that you've done 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to save most of my questions because uh, I have many, but I really appreciate in particular, uh, Laurie, you know, there was a lot of information already in the report, but appreciate you kind, kind of uh, uh, dumbing it down a little bit for us around, you know, the basics from substations to different storage options and understanding those because I, I think that's just very helpful for us to understand just in a concrete way what, what this looks like. Um, taking on just the very narrow question of how we improve resilience in the short run, it seems to me that storage looks to be something of an alternative to backup generation, or it could be, um, if you had enough storage capacity. And I think we would all prefer to go the storage route because backup generation obviously requires the use of fuel, that is, a fossil fuel, uh, and frankly, I'm doubtful about the reliability of supplies of fuel if there's a real emergency, and every Bay Area community is clamoring for fuel for their backup facilities at the same time, and whether or not people really honor their contracts uh, when, when you know what hits the fan. So I, I'm really interested in, in storage as that alternative, and I'm just ho hopeful to understand some context around the cost if we were to decide, hey, rather than investing in a lot of generation as backup for these facilities, we go the route that we're going, it appears on station 37 and say, we're gonna make significant investments around storage instead. What does that look like from a cost standpoint and feasibility standpoint? Mayor Licardo, so uh, we did do some preliminary in, uh, investigation in regards to what it would take to bring solar and uh, backup uh, storage. Uh, for fire station 37 within the design for the facility there are store uh, i'm sorry there are there is a solar energy system uh, that's planned for the rooftop uh, of the facility that would support about 20 percent of the facility's electrical demand uh, there was some evaluation in terms of potential battery storage as well too uh, for the conditions of an outage uh, we like to plan for at least 72 hours of operation with a backup system uh, the cost for a solar energy battery system for that would be significant. Uh, we're still looking at the numbers. In terms of the size of the battery systems, we are already looking at between three to five large storage containers, those Conex box uh, size uh, um, boxes uh, on the site. So there are site constraints, uh, considerations that we have to look at as well as the cost uh, for, for the system as well. So I know I know we're shooting at a moving target here because the cost of storage is dropping pretty rapidly. But could you just give me an order of magnitude if we were to say we want 72 hours of storage versus a backup generator, what the cost looks like? We would have to get back to you. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Understood. Understood. And then finally, I know we're going to. There's going to be a lot of questions about municipalization and how, and it's a very long road. That's very clear, and I've. You know, I had some conversations with folks in Sacramento, and it's clear that there are strong political forces, not just PG&E against, uh, that we need to wrestle with. I understand IBEW is very adamant <laughs> against San Francisco's attempts to municipalize. Um, so they're going to have to deal with that issue. Obviously, there's a lot of other ones. As we think about the targeted municipalization route, given the fact that we do have large development going under underway now in, in downtown and Deardon and Barry S and other opportunities for us to start to think about how we dip our toe in this water. Does it require us, first of all, to have a ballot measure to get voter approval for even targeted municipalization? And, and secondly, I assume we would still need state legislation to enable us to control distribution across, across rights of way. Is that right? Yeah, so maybe I'll take the, the first question. Um, no, I, I don't think it's, it requires state legislation to um, own distribution infrastructure. Um, and I'll defer to city attorney, but my understanding is through the California Constitution, a local city can opt to own that. Um, I'll let you expand on that, or Louisa, if you want a, a little more, and then maybe we'll take the second question. Um, I'm going to defer to Louisa Elkins, our attorney for CCA, on that question. Oh, hi, Louisa Elkins from City Attorney's Office. Uh, yes, that is correct. The California Constitution allows municipal um, local governments to uh, form and operate their municipal utilities. 
So I think that's the first question. In terms of the revenue bonds, I think that really depends on the infrastructure that needs to be installed. So, um, you know, depending on, um, there's, there's different ways to structure that. Sometimes new infrastructure often is paid by a developer and either turned over to, to the investor-owned utility and sometimes to a publicly-owned utility. There might be additional infrastructure investments that a publicly-owned utility may need to make, and if that was the case, we may need to issue revenue bonds. That is primarily one of the reasons that San Francisco went out for that Proposition A that passed um, about a year ago is that they are installing um, a higher voltage distribution backbone that runs from Candlestick all the way um, down to the ferry building on, on that portion of the city. And in order to install that distribution infrastructure to connect all of that new development load, they needed revenue bond funding for that. And so that's why they went um, to the voters to, to get that authority. So it really depends on the type of infrastructure that, that we may need to own and operate and what funding needs we have. Okay. As I understand it, we don't need a vote in San Jose for lease revenue bonds. Is that right? Mayor, actually, we would need a vote. We would? Yes. Okay, I thought there was some type of bond where we don't need to go to the voters for authority because we're actually looking at lease revenue bonds in the housing context. Am I mistaken? Luis, I'm going to let you weigh in on that. Yeah, we're still reviewing those issues, but we, uh, according to the charter, uh, section uh, 1221, uh -huh. uh, for revenue bonds for public utilities are required, uh, the majority of the voters need to approve For those public funds. utilities. Correct. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, to the council. Questions or comments? Councilmember Sparta. Yes, I... Um, Thank you again. This was very comprehensive, and thank you for taking the time with meeting with my office um, as well beforehand. But I just really kind of wanted to reiterate sort of my concerns because I remember, gosh, when was it about a dozen years ago now, maybe a little bit more, when we had the heat wave combined with the power outages here in San Jose. It was a nightmare. We had the fire department going door to door. Um, to notify populations who were um, non-English speaking, uh, very vulnerable populations with seniors and small children. Um, and so I just want to, to raise that flag that we really need to keep those vulnerable populations in mind when we talk about sort of some of the hard solutions around storage and some of these other issues. We have um, a housing crisis that we didn't have then, so we have some very densely packed um, apartments and homes um, and some of these issues as well. So I just wanted to raise that issue. I know emergency services has been working on this, but I just wanted to raise that other issue um, with your folks as well. When I saw the map of the facilities, for example, there's a fire station um, in my district, Fire Station 16, it's basically in a converted home <laughs> um, in the neighborhood that it serves. And they're very proud to serve the neighborhood that they serve, but there's really, they don't have any of those things. And the whole community would go to them for help. So um, it's just one of those sort of worst case scenarios that I worry about as we move forward in the coming months. Thank you. Council Member Foley. Thank you, that was really an informative presentation from all three of you, that was really helpful. You helped me actually understand all different aspects of the issue that we face. I'm um, shocked, I guess I shouldn't be, that PG&E wants to increase its rate of return to 14% from the 10 plus percent it's uh, given now by authority of the state. I just find that unconscionable given the situation that we're in as a result of fire, uh, wildfires that um, they've caused. I just, I, I, I don't know how those people sleep at night. That's a personal note. Um, I do, uh, I, this is inform uh, very interesting. I'm very curious about the municipalization and uh, you answered a lot of my questions, but uh, how would we go forward What's the next steps if we wanted to continue to take a look at that? 
Yeah, I, th I think we got great direction from the council back in June around the advocacy principles, and I, I really think that is the, the first step as, as we teed up, you know, there, there's several challenges. One, in terms of the acquisition process of the assets, right? Right now in California, there's nothing that requires an, an investor-owned utility to sell their assets, so the only process is eminent domain, and it's a very long legal challenge, so I think you know, we are already engaging in the legislature to hopefully get legislation that has a, a more viable process to acquire that infrastructure. Um, we're working with the California Municipal Utilities Association, some of these other cities that are also interested in this option, like San Francisco and Davis and South San Joaquin Irrigation District. They've also been trying to municipalize for about a decade. Um, so we're engaging with them, and as well as the American Power, Public Power Association, and, and looking at legislation that has worked in other states to allow local entities to acquire these assets. So that's one um, aspect. The other aspect I would say that the principles really helped is, and, and as the mayor mentioned, you know, uh, there is obviously a, a huge labor strategy that we're going to have to put together and, and build a broader coalition around. In the staff report, um, you might have seen there's pretty early on in the legislation, the legislative session this year when pg and &E announced the bankruptcy and San Francisco was pretty vocal about their interest in municipalization. Um, there was a lot of anti-municipalization um, materials that were circulated around San Francisco and that's in the memo. And, um, the life-size version of it is interesting. It's like a small child <laughs> that big <laughs> of a brochure that, um, you know, makes a lot of assertions around uh, the, you know, the, the pitfalls of a municipal utility, and that really was printed by the labor unions, and, you know, they have some concerns around their jobs, and so I think that's a strategy that we would have to work on. Mm -hmm. um, we are collaborating with San Francisco on that, you know, obviously, um, there would have to be a, a union strategy. San Francisco is, you know, a very um, pro-union city, and so they're working on that aspect of it. I think um, we'll continue to need to work on that in Sacramento to, to build a broader coalition around that. And then finally, um, we'll need to work on, um, you know, some of the challenges around how much uh, ratepayer funds that pg and &E can spend to lobby against a campaign. So we know that if we have to go to the voters, for revenue bonds, that's what happened in Davis, that they spent millions of dollars to prevent a yes vote there and were successful. The same thing has happened in San Francisco. CCAs actually got legislation um, several years ago that prevents um, investor-owned utilities from using ratepayer funds to lobby against a city that wants to form a CCA. So it may be possible to expand that type of legislation where cities also want to look at forming a publicly owned utility, that, that's definitely going to be a challenge. SMUD also, Davis and SMUD faced that when Davis tried to join SMUD. Um, SMUD as a public entity, you know, couldn't spend funds to, to mount a campaign against, and, and there was a pretty significant campaign. And, and even the legislation that the CCAs got several years ago, pg and &E spent over $40 million to try to defeat that. It, uh, they didn't actually wow. win, um, but, but it is a significant challenge. Wow. So. Would microgrids be an alternative to full municipalization or no? And, and how would we go about implementing a microgrid? Yeah, I, I think there's both short and long-term solutions, right? So the CCA provides some benefits on the generation side where we can hope to control some costs and invest in storage. Um, you know, I think in terms of municipalization where there's new development, there may be... Um, I say short, but it's probably more like medium term opportunities to work with new developers there to possibly own that infrastructure. And what that would allow us to do is, you know, either utilities, only utilities can cross a public right of way. And so often larger developments, you know, there's many streets and right of ways. And so that limits the amount of solar and storage that can be installed in that geographic area. So by owning um, some of that distribution infrastructure, we could enable possibly a larger microgrid. And so some of the sections of the city would have some more resiliency benefits. So, you know, we think that's something we're actively exploring. We will definitely come back to council when we have some more firm recommendations around that. But we think 
Um, you know, we need multiple strategies on this, both short, medium, and longer term, and obviously full municipalization is a longer term strategy. I do think um, it's important to continue to work on that, and that's why we came to council in June for those advocacy principles um, to see if we, if we can advance that, but that definitely will be a longer term effort. Okay, thank you. You had mentioned uh, that Borrego Springs was an example of a microgrid and that that included residential storage. What does that look like? Did the, and who paid for the installation of the residential, the storage on the homes? Yeah, so it's currently under construction, but my understanding, or it might actually still be in design, but my understanding is the developer will pay for that. So you, you see that across California now that a lot of new developments have solar. That's actually the California building code now requires. Um, and a lot of developers are pairing that with storage on site. So I would assume that that development, the, the developer will pay, this, the same developer that constructs the homes will also install the solar and, and the storage to enable those technologies. Okay, great, thank you. With regards to bringing our uh, facilities up to uh, handle critical power short power outages that do not have them, the 32, 175,000 to bring them up, uh, including the service kit. How quickly could that be implemented? I'm very concerned that a, a wildfire occurs tomorrow, we're shut down and we don't have the capacity in our cooling centers, in our fire stations, and other really critical places uh, to our residents. Uh, that we need to get up and operating. So how quickly could we implement that? Great question, uh, Council Member Foley. We've been doing that research as well too. Um, with the heightened um, concern that a PSPS event can happen, uh, many jurisdictions and larger companies are looking at the same thing. Uh, we've been doing our research and a lot of the stock for generators have been going pretty quickly. Even those that are on a rental basis, they are already accounted for. Um, larger corporations that are just proactively spending the money to lease out those rental units in case of need. Uh, so the stock is very, very short at this point. Uh, in coordination with our suppliers, we've um, gotten some feedback that it could take several months or upwards of a year to actually get these equipments and get them procured, um, uh, built, and then delivered uh, to the city. So it is a very long timeline uh, to get this type of equipment in place. Uh, just because of the current so, uh, shortage, as well as the time that it takes to build uh, the infrastructure as well. Okay, that's not what I wanted to hear, but thank you. Neither did we, but it's uh, yeah, unfortunately um, the market conditions at this point. No, I understand. Even residents are out buying power generators to try and figure out how to deal with the problem. Uh, we have solar panels at my house. We've talked about how could we get a backup or a storage, uh, back, battery storage, and it's not something that's readily available. Um, is it, are there facilities that do have the backup that they need that could be relocated to the fire stations and the uh, cooling centers that might, uh, that we could do more quick, more readily, and should we do that? Yes, and we've already built that in place as well, too. We do have 10 portable generators in our inventory, uh, in, in our stock. Um, it is an evaluation, though, that depending on the size of the generator and the electrical need of the particular facility that we're bringing it to, we need to right-size those as well. Uh, we don't want to be overkill, and we don't want to have a, a, a under capacity for the generators we're bringing in. Uh, but that is a scenario that depending on what areas of the city is affected and those facilities that do not need those portable generators, we can move them and, and shuffle them to the different areas that do need them. Can you let us know which uh, cooling centers, I'm assuming some of those are uh, community centers, yes. which ones have the backups and which ones don't? It would be really important because in our emergency plan, we are to... Uh, Camden Community Center, for example, is our uh, congregating area. If it doesn't have a cooling center that backup that is functional, I wouldn't want folks to head over there thinking they're going to benefit from anything and only to find gridlock and uh, heat when it's supposed to be cool out. Yes, that's, that's our concern as well, too, to ensure that those facilities, if promoted, that they're activated, uh, are operational. 
Uh, there are now 11 cooling and warming sites. The Bascom Community Center has been added to the list as well. All 11 currently do not have backup generation. Also not what I wanted to hear. Yes. Um, okay, thank you, I, I appreciate that. I think the, the backup generation is really critical that we do what we can as quickly as possible. We don't know when a wildfire emergency is going to occur, nor do we know when an earthquake is going to occur that will also result in the same complications, the same problems, and the same risk uh, to our, our residents. Having survived or, or lost my house in the 1989 earthquake, I know what happens when you're in gridlock and you can't resolve the problem and, and how everyone's trying to get home at the same time and our infrastructure is overloaded. In, in those days, our cell phones didn't work the, and may not this time either, and that's a whole other issue I understand, but uh, it, it, I would encourage us to make that a priority to install the backups that we need to at the cooling centers and other places that folks are gonna need to go. Thank you. Councilmember Jimenez. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, like everyone, I appreciate the information. I think, uh, as I told you, Lori, in the past when we've met, that uh, really, I personally need to, to get this boiled down to its very basic elements, so I very much appreciate that. And it seems like I'm not alone, um, which is good. Um, one thing I would say before I ask a few questions is that I think we're, we're in a very uh, unfortunate and opportune time, given what's happening with PG&E, and so, I just wanted to express very publicly that I'm totally supportive of moving forward with that, essentially having everything on the table to figure out, figure out if it's uh, bringing it, you know, the energy, uh, the transmission, and all that infrastructure in-house. Uh, and so I, I appreciate all the work you're doing to try to figure out what paths are, are, are available and, and what doors we should be walking through. So I appreciate that. Um, a few questions. One is the the 84.5 million uh, dollars that was already, I guess, been allocated through the EPIC program. I think you have it on the. What I'm curious about is, are there? Did the city of San Jose receive any of that funding? Did did or and if not, how do we make sure we're sort of in the ball game to to receive some of that money? Sure. So no, we haven't received any of that funding, and and that is something that we're actively working on to to make sure that um, if there is additional funding available, that we can leverage that to ensure that we're. <laughs> Um, as resilient as we can. Do, do we expect that there will be another, I don't know if it's a round of distribution or grant applications or what it is or how yeah, it's done, but. We're not sure about that, but also part of the advocacy work that we're doing in Sacramento is around ensuring there's more funding for critical facilities and microgrids and resiliency efforts, you know. Um, you're right, there's many challenges from PG&E and you know, there's many stakeholders that are, are looking to improve resiliency, so that's a large amount of the efforts that we're spending time on in Sacramento to advocate for funding. Okay, thank you. It, it, the other question I have is, is around something you mentioned, I think you, you uh, stated it very well because I think my, my sense of a microgrid was, oh, well, it's just not connected to the grid, but in fact, it is connected to the grid. It, it just, uh, it has, the, as far as my understanding and everything I've seen, it has the ability to sort of be an island if necessary, right? Is right, that, okay. right, right. That's important to note is that typically it's more economical for it to be connected to the grid, but the, the main benefit of it is that it can disconnect and operate when the rest of the grid goes down. So, so if there is a micro grid in place uh, it, and it's connected to the grid, do, does it does it only begin to become a micro grid if and when the grid there's a disconnection from the grid, or or there are some inherent benefit to it already being a micro grid? Yeah, there there sense? are inherent benefits even if it never islands and it's never independently operated. That the main benefit is that you can install more distributed resources and. That's a complicated term, but that basically means more solar and storage, um, more control features to really balance the electricity locally. Um, so, so an important thing to just note about electricity is that it always has to be balanced, right? There's always load and generation, and at the macro level, that's what the California Independent System Operator is doing. So they're powering up and powering down all of the time. But what a microgrid can do is to do that locally, and so there's less burden on the on the larger power grid. And, and if it is, in fact, connected to the grid until it islands itself, 
Um, are there any cost savings, assuming PG&E is the one providing the energy and the transmission and all that? I mean, is there? Sure, yeah, it's similar cost savings to if you were to install solar and storage on your house, right? You're using less electricity from mm -hmm. PG&E or San Jose Clean Energy. Um, and so you're able to lower your own bill. And so those same benefits benefit a microgrid. So if you think of a university campus, many campuses have tried this and, and been a successful model where the that campus can lower its electricity costs because it's generating more electricity on site versus from the utility. Now, of course, there's no free lunch. In order to get those benefits, they have to invest in that infrastructure, right? So there's mm -hmm. the capital costs of this, the solar and the storage that they've had to install, and either they finance that through bonds or, or cash, or um, in, in the case of some residents, um, some of it can be financed through lease payments. So all of that needs to be balanced. Okay. The, the other question I had, it, it may be a silly question, but what, what um, <laughs> When does a micro a micro grid cease becoming a micro grid? When does it become a a macro grid, for lack of a better word? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Is it is it geography? Is it is it the amount of generation? Is it the store? I mean, trying to understand sort of when we're not talking about micro grids any longer. Yeah, I think um, when we're not talking about micro grids, you can think of you know the status quo today, right, where, um, you know, in my neighborhood, there's local distribution lines that connect all of the houses. Some people might have solar, but however, um, you know, those benefits, it, it's often grid connected, but it can't island. If there's a power outage, you know, we're, we're all just without electricity. So I would say the status quo is really when we're not talking about a microgrid and, um, when you're talking about a microgrid, I think the main benefit is in a power outage, it can island and provide those resiliency benefits and also enable more solar and more storage. So I, I would think it as most of the infrastructure you see today is without a microgrid. So for example, the city of Santa Clara has you know their own generation. They, they do everything PG&E does for Santa Clara. Um, if you're looking at the state of California, they're quite for seemingly an island <laughs> within right. the PG&E infrastructure. Right. And so would they be considered a microgrid of sorts within the broader infrastructure? And I guess that's what I'm getting you at. You could I'm think of it like that. Okay. You could think Is of it. I, I think one of the challenges there where, yes, you're right, that they have um, some benefits with, you know, say there was a larger cascading outage that, you know, potentially de-energized the rest of the Bay Area. The benefits that Santa Clara has is that they have um, some gas fire generation, similar to, to Metcalf, what we have in, here in San Jose, but they own the distribution wires. Um, they don't they don't have enough generation to power everything in Santa Clara, but because they own that distribution infrastructure, they possibly may be able to power some of their critical facilities. We've been meeting with them, and, and they're also working through this. It's not. It's, it's not clear, um, you know, how much more resilient they will be because they are connected to the larger macro grid. So I wouldn't call that a, a traditional micro grid where they can just island and mm -hmm. everybody in Santa Clara will have power, but they certainly have some benefits in that there's generation and they own the distribution. The other benefit is, is that um, when the grid comes back up, they may be able to supply power and, and get that power up more quickly than we may with PG&E because PG&E will be inspecting and looking at a larger service territory. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. I, I appreciate that. The, the other question I have is related to some of the other, I, I think the gentleman from Public Works and maybe answer some of the questions, but remind me, the cooling centers, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the overnight warming locations, for example, they've moved locations and so, can you remind me, the cooling centers, uh, have they? Have we been moving them around? I know we just brought Bascom online, and so I'm curious how we handle that, right? If in fact we go install backup, uh, you know, uh, equipment at Bascom, for example, but then we move it to another facility, how we manage that? Oh, please. I could, uh, Kip Parkman's deputy city manager with the emergency management remit. Uh, this is a really good question, and I think it also has been raised several times. So I wanted to outline how we would approach it in the case of an emergency so you understand that while this is absolutely critical that we think about this in the short and medium term, we have a way that will handle this. So if we are in a situation either through a planned power shutoff 
or an earthquake that requires us to activate those centers for mass care, sheltering, heating, or cooling, one of the things that we'll do is we'll immediately ask for mutual aid. And we have existing agreements with the state, with local jurisdictions, across state lines, through those agreements where we can say very clearly, here is the type, number, quantity of backup generation that we need. And so we have, have very successfully deployed mutual aid over the years in this city, typically with police and fire. Increasingly around emergency management, that mutual aid network is strengthening. And so we um, would like to have our backup generation on premises, but in the absence and until then, we have a very robust system of mutual aid where we can request that and expect that to be received from other jurisdictions. So what we do is immediately try to provision all of the necessary shelters and all of the necessary fa facilities through that mutual aid. Now, whether they can take that generation or not is a key thing. So part of the work that Walter is doing in parallel and others are looking at what we would need to be able to do even to receive the mutual aid in a way that's useful. So there is an urgency to this work, but I did want to be clear that we have the capability to request and receive backup generation both from uh, facilities and uh, cities nearby and from state, National Guard, and other units in the case of an actual emergency, especially in the case of a large-scale emergency like an earthquake. Yeah, I appreciate that. I guess the one thing that comes to mind as you were talking is, is there, are, are, and I'm sure you've, you guys have thought about this, uh, but are there circumstances in which there's such a disastrous event that it, it impacts <laughs> the Bay Area, uh, and so one would say those folks maybe wouldn't be able to provide them. Some of the folks wouldn't be able to provide the mutual aid. Certainly yeah, yeah, this is a, literally the thing that keeps me up at night. And this is where we look at things like using the airport as a bridge in to bring in the necessary equipment, the ability to helicopter things into where you need them to be, all of those kinds of things that we think through in the case of a major disaster where the transportation routes are paralyzed and bridges are out. Mm -hmm. um, so part of what we're also looking at is it, it, both with this um, power safety shutoff and the larger plan is what are those transportation corridors, what are those routes through, um, and who, are, who has the equipment and the capability to handle those. One of the, one of the lessons learned from the, the series of, uh, continuing series of hurricanes that uh, the Southeast in particular has affected is the need to do that kind of activation early and forcefully, and to really, frankly, in my opinion, one of the things I was actually talking about my with my father about this is to make sure that we are engaging deeply with the military capabilities that are out there, because the organization that has the ability to do this kind of forward lift stuff move these resources in place in the North American context is really the National Guard and the military. And so uh, not just relying on adjacent police and fire, but going uh, immediately to where we need that and asking for those kinds of resources to be deployed in the case of a, a, a large scale catastrophe. Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate it. And, and then just one last question. I, you know, just out of the memo, I think on page 14 it says, while 32 facilities do not have generators or have sufficient levels of backup, actually that's the last part of the sentence, but that, that really stood out to me. And so what I'm curious about is, do we, I, I'm sure we have an inventory as to where those 32 locations are. Um, I, I don't know if I missed it in here, but I, I would like to know where those are. I mean, if they're all, as an example, concentrated in South San Jose, that would worry me. <laughs> but, but I think that's a, a logical question. And so to the extent we can get some of that information, I think it'd be, it'd be valuable. Yes, uh, we have that list. We can share it. That list has also been shared with pg and &E and Cal OES as well. Okay, wonderful. And thank you. And then the, the other, the very last question I had, and this, uh, just thinking about the, the number of, trying to go back to the beginning of the slides, uh, there was a, it's right at the beginning where it talks about uh, that PG&E has identified an X number of folks that maybe, uh, you know, have uh, critical sort of uh, needs at home, whether it be, you know, uh, um, you know, a ventilator or a wheelchair or, you know, things of that nature. And, and I think the, the comment was that they identified a certain number, but we thought it was much higher. Um, and I think I, I, I think I got something in the mail recently from pg &E. <laughs> Um, but uh, what, what I was curious about is how do, how do you think they're doing a good enough job of identifying folks in the community, especially because we think the numbers are much higher than what they've put out. I think they identified 2,000 or so people. I'm trying to find the number. Yeah, so it's, a, it's just over 7,000. Oh, there and, you go. And, and that's a great question, and, and it probably requires a little bit of explanation. So in, in California, if you are using a device that requires a lot of a medical device, that requires a lot of electricity, you, call, you qualify for a special rate that basically lowers your utility bill because you have a medical condition. And in order to get that rate, 
you um, sign up as a medical baseline customer. Now, that's just an economic rate, right? It was never intended um, for this type of purpose to identify all customers that might be vulnerable in an outage. It was medical ba baseline rates were developed to provide some um, financial ease to customers that had a medical device. So we know in San Jose that there's a you know just over 7,000 of these customers. We know um, they are especially vulnerable, but we also know that a lot of people may not have signed up for this rate, or they may have conditions where they're not using a lot of electricity, so maybe they don't qualify, but they still have vulnerabilities in a power outage. And so, yes, we think that is an area where um, you know, PG&E has not done a sufficient job in identifying all of those with needs and, and having a sufficient plan around that to, to make sure that they understand what's going on and more importantly, that they um, have a place to go. So they have said that they will call and they will also door knock those medical baseline customers. Um, but you know, an area that we have identified that's particularly concerning is there isn't, um, you know, there, they are not telling them, well, where should they go to plug in? And so that's where we think the cooling centers are, are very important in terms of a place for them to go. Because if they don't have another place, what they might do is just call 911. Mm -hmm. and, and so and so they're door knocking on the people that have received that benefit through, mm -hmm. th that they've identified as a recipient through that program you're talking about. Right, right? exactly. So yeah. the only way for PG needed to know is if they have self-identified to be on that rate. And then I would just say the other challenge with PG&E as, you know, myself and, and many people have a PG&E account for many, many years, right? Maybe they got their PG&E account 20 years ago and their contact information is not up to date. And so that's another challenge um, just with customers generally is that they might not have a current address, especially now that a lot of us receive bills electronically, they might not have the right phone number yeah. or the right physical address for these customers. And so, you know, I, I would, in a normal world, I would say, well, I, I, I PG&E should do this work and they should do everything they can to identify these people, but given <laughs> the current state of the company and what we've seen them do or not do. I, I don't have much faith that they're gonna act adequately reach out to folks. And then, you know, and just looking at the number, 7,365 medical baseline customers, certainly that's within their program, but I gotta imagine in a city of more than one million people that there are more people than this that, that depend on, <laughs> on electricity. And so what I'm curious about is, and, and, and it's more just a statement, but I, I think to the extent it prods so, someone, Kip maybe for example, right? Some of the, the big brains at the city to really think about this is, uh, you know, I recently got appointed to the Smart Cities Committee and I know we often talk about big data and how to use data. And so I'm curious about is in, in the many, many tentacles that the city has and people in the residents' lives and every way we touch residents, I gotta imagine there's a way to get some of this data or maybe it already exists and to flesh it out so that way we can do our part and, and supplement what pg and is doing, which I believe is inadequate. Um, so to the extent that prods some thought or if you've thought about that, I think that's important to think about. We have thought about that, uh, Ray Reardon, Director of Emergency Management, and it's a good question because one of the key things that we've been doing is working with the county because of public health and those conditions, that's their responsibility, but we see our, our engagement with that very much. So we've been working with the county on their lists and they manage that because uh, a lot of this has to do with HIPAA laws and what information can be shared or not. Mm -hmm. But we have been working with mm -hmm. them to better understand the vulnerable, vulnerable populations that are out there that do require the medical devices. We've also been working with the, the, the fire department's also been table topping. How can they support uh, care facilities and other homes that, that may lose power to that these people are being cared for at. Mm -hmm. So we're working on a lot of activity to better understand where our pockets are of the, the, these populations so that we can address them more effectively that, that way. Right, and, and then I think an added challenge, which I'm sure you're cognizant of, is we live in a very diverse city, diverse county. <laughs> and so even when you reach people, these extra layers of language, of just culture, just a lot of different things. And so I don't envy the work ahead of you because it's gonna be very challenging. And, and so I'll just end with this question is, when do you think, because I'd like to see sort of if there is in fact an increase in people that we've identified and, and as that work sort of moves forward, is there gonna be a space in which you would tell us, hey, you know, pg e identified 7,000 plus, we actually identified 3,000 more and this is how we did it and this is where they 
reside in the city? I mean, is that something that we would see at some point? Part, uh, partly what we're doing is developing the disaster district office uh, plans. And in that, we're identifying where these facilities are located. So as we develop those plans, we'll give you that sort of profile of where the issues lie within each one of the districts. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for all the work. I appreciate it. This is not an easy issue to, to help move forward, but I, I think you guys are doing a good job. Appreciate it. I just want to follow up on Councilman Mendez's good questions. The, the 7,300 or so that have been identified as, these are people who are dependent on a medical device that uses electricity essentially to keep them alive in some way. Is um, that right? Not necessarily. You know, it, it, it could be any medical device that uses a lot of electricity. Okay. Um, and so it's an economic rate. It's a, it's a rate discount to ease that financial burden. Okay. Do, I mean, I know this would probably be very dependent on demographics, particularly around age, mm -hmm. but even to have a ballpark sense about whether that's about the right number or not, I imagine other cities would have if we were confident other cities did a good job of identifying such residents, um, I mean, we look at our number, it's around, what, seven-tenths of one percent of the population. Is there any way we can know by comparison, are we particularly low uh, relative to what we think the numbers are that are identified in other cities? I mean, in terms of just medical baseline rates, I don't think so, but in terms of the more complex issue of what other customers out there are going to have needs. Um, you know, I don't know. I think we're early in that. And, and yeah. you know, many cities have faced these challenges. You know, another challenge is just who is the, the end customer for PG&E, right? Some communities, you can think of mobile home parks where there's a meter in the front and many residents behind that meter that, you know, the utility would not have information about. They might just send the bill to the mobile home park owner. Right. Um, there's those types of challenges that, that have been challenging for many cities as these public safety power shutoff events have happened, just communicating to all of the people that might be impacted. So, um, you know, I, I would think we have done some early planning on that in terms of our communications plan and the table talk exercises that, that Ray has said. And, and, you know, I'll say the other thing that we're doing um, to supplement this is we have been messaging emergency preparedness both on San Jose's clean energy site and the city has been doing this as well and there's a lot of good work that's gone into that with Rosario. Thank you, Lori. And it sounds like our mobile home parks may be a good place for us to start, huh? No, thank you. Uh, Councilman Rennes. Thank you. Um, a lot of my questions have been answered and I appreciate um, my colleagues asking those. I think we're all kind of on the same baseline, if you will, in terms of information. So I'm gonna start with, with the, the backup generation. Um, so I know that pg e has not yet agreed to provide any. Is there any ways, way that we can make a case to the CPUC and compel them, maybe show them our, our threat assessment um, and, and how vulnerable our city would be? Is that, is that a, a, a viable path? Yeah, Councilor Marinas, we were just talking about that yesterday, and, oh. and maybe I'll ask Louisa to kind of comment on that. Ray has led a series of meetings with PG&E. We've been very clear about our needs. We've communicated to them that the Public Utilities Commission says they have a responsibility in that area. So we are asking our attorneys to kind of engage their attorneys on that and mm -hmm. kind of get to the bottom of it. We think they have a responsibility here. And so we're kind of ramping that up. Maybe Luis, I'll ask you to just add to that as well. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, yes, we're in the process of setting up a meeting with PG&E's council to talk specifically about uh, backup generation and their duty under the CPUC interim uh, de-energization guidelines. In addition to that, we are engaging uh, the CPUC level in two main proceedings. Uh, the first proceeding is the wildfire mitigation plan. We filed comments on behalf of the city uh, on August 21st. And in those comments, we requested the CPUC to direct PG&E to provide further analysis of the risk and mitigation activities related to de-energization de events that may cause a blackout in areas such as San Jose. 
Uh, we will continue to participate in, the, in this proceeding, specifically on the uh, September 19th. There is a workshop in which um, PG&E will present its uh, uh, wildfire mitigation plan and we will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, more importantly, we, uh, are, we will engage in the de-energization proceeding itself. Um, the CPUC recently opened the phase two of this proceeding. We, uh, in this proceeding, the CPUC will consider permanent de-energization guidelines and issues such as uh, cost allocation and who should bear the cost of these backup generators and uh, other uh, costs related to the response in a PSPS event uh, will be decided. The first of, a set of comments are due on 9-17th. Unfortunately, uh, the cost issues are not being considered quite yet, mm -hmm. but uh, the CPC issued a list of questions on several topics, which include uh, de-energization strategy and decision-making process, and de-energization of transmission lines. So we are coordinating with staff at this point to answer to those, uh, qu uh, to provide an answer to those questions. And okay. we'll continue to engage with the CPUC. Thank you. It, it sounds like it's it's a whole process in itself to, to get that going. So I, I appreciate it. I think um, the silver lining in, um, in the debriefing with, with Lori, um, the silver lining is now we have this assessment plan. <laughs> We now know if the big one hits, where we're vulnerable, and and if anything, I think that's our our silver lining, right? Now we have this plan. Now we can have this plan. Um, I'm going to move on to the the solar program. I know as part of next steps, you're going to incentivize some customers, um, and my question was, is this part of um, the when we incentivize the, the customers, is this part of our returns or is this part of like startup costs? What, how, how does that work? Sure, I'll, I'll provide a little preview, but we'll, we'll talk about it more when we bring the item to council. But PG&E is moving toward time of use rates. And so I think we've talked a little bit about this before, but what that means is right now customers pay a rate um, and it, it doesn't change by the hour of the day, most customers. Mm -hmm. um, that That's changing um, toward where They'll provide different pricing at different hours of the day, and and really the the thought and the policy behind that, where the CPUC is, is pushing municipal utilities to do that, really relates to that video we saw on the duck curve, where mm -hmm. we want to provide economic signals to customers to reduce their usage at night when the dirtiest power plants are operating and the solar has come offline. Um, and so, like all other PG&E rates, we're going to follow that and offer our discount, but we'll bring that. Um, to council, and we think those rates will incentivize um, solar and storage. The other thing that we'll do is uh, complete the final enrollment in San Jose Clean Energy. Those are the net energy metering customers, and present a plan to council around that that um, is slightly more attractive than PG&E, and hopefully will incentivize our, our customers to continue to install solar and storage at um, their homes and residents to make them more resilient, but also to meet our climate smart goals. I see, so you're doing that through a more attractive rate plan, similar to what PG&E is doing. Um, do we have any um, programs that are going to um, incentivize maybe um, for the average homeowner battery storage, on-site battery storage? Is that part of our plan? Yeah, we're in the early stages of that, and, and we will bring a program's roadmap to council, and that's certainly something um, that will be included in there is options for renewable energy resources and how we can partner both through rates and educational um, items, and then also, um, you know, perhaps providing some targeted in, in incentives to our customers that are most economically challenged with those technologies. So. That will be a roadmap that we'll bring in the spring. It's important to note, though, that still we're in the early days of San Jose Clean Energy. Um, you know, we're about six months into operations, and um, it's really important that we are financially stable before we start investing in programs. And so we're we're on track um, to meet our initial operating reserve targets this year, and then hopefully pay back the commercial pay rent debt next year. Um, 
But eventually, you know, we need to build a, a pretty large operating reserve um, that uh, equals 120 days of expenses. And for us, that's over $100 million that we need in a reserve. And that's going to take several years to get there. So um, our estimate right now is that we will not have that financial reserve until 2022. And then after that, we will recommend what investments, both in programs and rate discounts to council and um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different options there, and that's why we want to kind of get in front of that work, and we'll bring a roadmap to you in the spring to start to get some ideas on where we might focus, as well as to um, get input on some near-term things that we can do that are more educational, that don't cost as much money to start to incentivize these technologies. Thank you. Um, I can appreciate that you're, what, what is it, the fifth month? I think we're at six. Yeah, we launched in February, so yeah. now we're at end of August. So it seems like a long time, but, but it's not. Yeah. <laughs> you have programs yeah. and yeah. Um, so so I, I look forward to that. I I think um, it would be great to also um, maybe target some of those uh, who are most vulnerable with with some of these um, features because I know I, I get that this strategy that you've laid out for us is multi layered and in part is it's um, Owners on uh, on homeowners, and a part of it is is what we're going to do in with new um, development, and then um, in question of 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 how we're going to um, store um, or offer backup generation. Um, I have another question. Where I go? Okay, so I, I know that you mirror what um, PG and PG and E um, does with their care program. Um, but I, I saw that you that you recognize that there's about a, a 15 percent um, difference um, or 15 percent of, of resident that still qualify for low income. I understand we're still in our early stages and we are trying to target that 2022 mark for the um, for that 120 days of reserve. Will you when will you be able or when will we be able to to target that 15 percent? Yeah, I, I think there's some things that we can do to try to leverage funding from other sources. So one of the things in the, in, that you'll hear um, at the Transportation and Environment Committee on Climate Smart, there are some statewide programs that provide funding to low-income residents to help with solar and storage. Um, Grid Alternatives is a nonprofit similar to Habitat for Humanity where they install solar and storage on homes. So we're hoping to connect residents to those opportunities. I think those are some of the early things that we can do to help our low-income population while we're still trying to build our financial reserve and are limited in our ability to provide rate discounts. Um, so you'll see that, um, you know, both in our recommendations around uh, Climate Smart, but also in our program's roadmap. But I would really say, um, you know, it's probably 2022 and beyond when we can offer some targeted discounts to those customers. It's, it's definitely something, though, that we're already starting to do analysis work on. You know, as you might imagine, a, a lot of CCAs take different approaches to um, rate discounts and investments in programs that they provide. And there's no right answer. There's a lot of different options. And so it, we think it's important to frame that up for council and get your input early on so that when we do have funding available, we're, we're ready to go. But certainly one of the things that we're considering here in San Jose, just because of um, you know, the population and the type of customers that we serve from, you know, we, we have customers that are very needy and then customers that you know, may not really need the, the same amount of a rate discount, although you know, nobody wants to pay more than for their energy than they have to. And we recognize that, but we do really look at you know, the, the care income guidelines are, are very low and, and there are about 20% of our customers that qualify for that. And mm -hmm. you know, it's about in the $40,000 annual income range. But then there's um, a, a pretty large population, you know, about 15 to 20% um, of our customers that are below approximately about 85,000 a year for a household of three, which is low income here in the Bay Area. Um, that are not eligible for any type of discount on their mm -hmm. utility bill. And so we do see that as a, as a need and, and possibly an area where we can provide some benefits to those customers. I'm really glad to hear that. I think um, there is, uh, currently we're, 
we're seeing residents um, and nationwide react to um, things that the administration, the Trump administration is doing, especially around public charge, right? So we're seeing people not enroll into programs that they normally would, and I would, um, I would, I would wonder how it's impacting the care program because I know, I think, I imagine that, that they would ask for maybe if you're um, receiving WIC or SNAP or some some kind of of uh, federal assistance. Um, and so I wonder how that's going to impact our our low income residents here um, from from enrolling into care because like uh, Councilmember Jimenez said. I also saw something through the mail, and I think that's happening now, and so I wonder how, how our residents have responded, and maybe in, in a future presentation you can include what that looks like uh, for San Jose. I think that was the end of... Oh, you know, my question was about... The, uh, the last question I have is about uh, distribution centers, and how many did you say we have in San Jose? Um, do you mean substations? Yes, substations. I, uh -huh. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but several dozen substations within the area, and mm -hmm. um, you know that's why we we put the the picture in the the presentation around that. Often they get confused for yes. generation plants, um, yes. but they're transformers that are stepping down the voltage to lower voltage to serve distribution. Yeah, I'm I'm learning so much <laughs> um, about energy uh, generation. Um, I appreciate it. That was, I think that's the end of my questions. I appreciate um, all the work that you've done. I, uh, especially the the work that you've condensed in ten, into 10 weeks, I, I heard earlier, uh, that normally would take about six to nine months. And so thank you so much for reprioritizing your workload for um, allowing us to have this assessment, um, this threat assessment completed so that we can uh, take the next steps and make sure that we're prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, I thought just a quick question. I wanted to see if you could expand on why the, uh, the generators would come at a cost of nearly a million dollars. Yes, uh, Council Member Perales. So when we're looking at uh, how to best approach the backup generation, especially for the cooling centers, um, the portable kits, they're the smaller 100 kW portable generators that we'd bring and actually just keep on site permanently, uh, along with the uh, portable air conditioning units, uh, the lighting towers. Um, the facility would not have any other lighting besides these lighting towers that we'd bring in, um, as well as uh, some charging ports uh, just for cell phones and things of that nature. Um, that's what we're considering really bare bones just to keep the cooling aspects in place. Um, for the full breadth of the operations of the center, whether it's the kitchen, the operations, the lighting, the PCs, things of that nature, uh, that's where that bigger load comes in, uh, bigger storage for, for fuel, et cetera. Uh, that is just to keep the, the main operations in place for those centers as we go along. So I guess I'm curious still on the million dollars because I, I mean, I, I'm. I was, again, this, I'm, I'm novice here, but I'm looking online and finding only, you know, like for large scale commercial uses, uh, large buildings of like max like $400,000 for a generator. So what else is the cost here? Desi uh, design and engineering as well too. So the soft cost going into ensuring that we're right sizing it, the equipment, the installation, uh, we're bringing all those factors in. Uh, this is just a rough cost estimate at this point as well too. So Why wouldn't without... we just get an off the shelf type of generator? I mean, there's dozens and dozens of them, right? Like, why would we design our own? Um, it's really about site conditions as well, too. So we want to make sure that whatever we are putting in, it is going to work, it's going to be efficient, it's going to supply what's needed. Um, so without that initial um, dedicated engineering side of it, uh, we will need those soft costs. But you're correct, uh, depending on what is available, if it is a right fit, we'll definitely look into that as well too. And, uh, the million dollars is a rough cost estimate. It could be lower, but we wanted to ensure that if needed, we have that, that additional buffer. Yeah, and so if I could just weigh in a little bit, Walter, just to kind of help out. So certainly we would be buying a product that technically is off the shelf, but it would be designed to meet the load. Um, and so these, these generators are extremely large. We, we have them at, at many of our fire stations right now. Uh, I don't know what, how would you describe the size of it? You know, 20 feet by 10 feet wide, very large uh, pieces of equipment. But 
Yeah, we don't specifically design the, the piece of equipment. Uh, we just make sure the piece of equipment can meet the, the needs of the facility, and that's where the design comes in. Obviously, there is supporting infrastructure, a pad and, and conduits and such that go into it. And I think Walt, Walt is right. A million is very rough. I'm sure some would be less, and then maybe some might be more. Um, but I think that's kind of an, an average, extremely rough order of magnitude estimate. Okay. I just, you know, again, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm, I am questioning out of as a novice, but nothing I can find for off the shelf, even semi truck trailer sized, you know, generators come anywhere near a million dollars. Um, and I understand determining the load, but certainly they make off the shelf generators that work for different loads, right? So you determine your load and then you go look on the shelf for the right generator that matches that load. Yes. Um, that's not to, you know, to explain the pad or the, the conduits that might be, need to be done, but that's different. It sounded like, um, you know, there was a big estimate here for some of these generators. And we're also not talking all of these facilities um, extremely large, right? Some of our community centers and stuff. I also would remind us that we're talking about during an emergency situation, right? We're not talking about business as usual, right? So we're not talking about, let's just go around our day, day to day, and, 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 and utilize the same amount of, of you know, electricity that we would be using. Uh, we're in an emergency situation, so we would hope that people are changing, right, a little bit of, of, of how we might be responding, and we sort of say, all right, what is the, what is the necessity that we need to actually run these facilities um, you know, for, for a, 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 you know, a, a certain period of time yes. um, during an emergency type situation um, and, and, then, and then go from there versus <coughs> just what it looked like, what it sounded like, because I, I was looking at the screen going, wow, that is, it's kind of scaring us with a, with a you know, $14 million price tag, right, on, on trying to, uh, to, to shore up some of these other facilities. Um, and I appreciate the sort of the, the initial approach of, well, let's at least get some of these portable smaller generators, um, right, to do the, the bare bones. Yes. Um, Council Member, if I could, just wanna, it just, I, cause I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I'll just tell you from my own experience, installing the generators in the fire stations in the last bond program was quite complicated. So generators need to be operated. I think we're probably operating them once a month or some, some sort of standard like that. The environmental considerations on the operation of each generator is pretty significant in terms of how we attenuate sound and emissions and all of these things. And I think that's what Walter is getting to. The site conditions really drive up a lot of the cost. There's the unit itself, but then how we place that unit and how we operate that unit in compliance with all these rules and regulations, it does drive the cost up. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of interesting how kind of complicated it gets to just have an emergency generator at a fire station. Mm -hmm. But I think your questions are completely legit. I think there may be ways for us to kind of economize the, the cost with, you know, uh, purchasing of multiple units and, and those sorts of things. But, you know, thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, and it's helpful to write that again, as I'm I'll say for a third time, I'm, I'm, I don't I don't understand this business, right? <laughs> but I just I'm, I'm kind of it, it because it's such it looks like such a uh, a big hurdle in front of us to try and ready up. You know how many were there? There were I think you said number of facilities that we had thirty something, right? That um, thirty two, correct? Thirty two, right? That 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 are sort of not prepared at least for this emergency type of situation because every other solution we're talking about is much more longer term. Right, and we, we recognize that. Yeah. So at a bare minimum, you know, we, we have this approach where we can get these smaller generators and kind of have some bare bones. Um, but even to, to ready all of our, you know, important facilities, especially like the firefighter, or the, I mean, sorry, the, the uh, fire stations and then the yeah. warming uh, and cooling locations, we know that um, these are facilities that we would want to make sure have that backup uh, generator. And it just, it was shocking to me to see the price tag to, to look so high. So. Yes, if I may add, the labor to install these larger units can be very significant as well too. And with the equipment needed, whether it's cranes or flatbed vehicles to bring the equipment in, uh, that adds to the cost, absolutely. Comparatively speaking though, for 21 out of the 32 sites, so 11 of the cooling centers and then the uh, 21 remaining sites, those are uh, sanitary pump stations and fire stations, uh, we have calculated those to be smaller generators. So those are only $100,000 at each of those sites. Okay. 
Um, so the larger cost gap is with those 11 cooling and warming centers. Uh, again, bare bones, we're looking at 175,000, but for full operations, upwards of a million. And we can make the decision that we don't need full operations. We just keep it to the smaller bare bones aspects. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Council Member Spartan. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, as we talk about this, we're talking about generators and supplies for city buildings. So in my district, there, you know, it has one of the cooling centers, but it's very small and could not hold very many people. And so in the past, some of the things I've done um, in pre a previous life has been able to pre-position equipment um, and uh, which requires maintenance and all sorts of other issues as well. Um, but also um, really develop strong relationships with faith-based um, organizations because in this sort of type of scenario, they will actually be opening their doors and um, in districts like mine, people are gonna go there and, and they're also bigger and in my case, newer facilities um, than what the city has to offer. And so I just wanted to throw that out there and I'm willing to talk offline and assist in any way that I can on doing that. But again, I do think pre-positioning um, those equipments, uh, equipment and supplies um, ahead of time with our partners as well, even if it's just an arc. But again, um, to the point, it's not just getting it in there and storing it there, it's maintaining it throughout so that when we need it, it's fully operable. So thank you. Uh, thank you, that's a very good comment on the emergency management side. We are engaging not just the county, but our partners and the, the nonprofit organizations, the CBOs, uh, the faith-based organizations, and we're considering that as part of our whole protocol. It's just not just relying on our own sources, but what other resources are available in the community to help us reach those, uh, particularly the vulnerable populations that will reach go out that way. Yeah, and also to include that we may need to provide some of these smaller generators in their facilities, because frankly, again, our, the city is very diverse, right? But in my district, the cooling center is not adequate for, you know, more than a few dozen people, right? A couple dozen folks. Um, and so we're gonna rely on some other facility in my district, it might be a large faith-based organization, um, but in another district, it might be something else. And so um, just to sort of identify those and, and be open to providing them with the equipment that we can pre-position for these facilities would be helpful. Uh, Councilor Yeah. So I had a question about um, the, the backup generators. Uh, I think Dave said that we had to like every now and then turn it on to keep it running or whatever. But in the case of a emergency where the grid was shut down, what is the capacity for actually relying on the backups as our kind of main source of energy for a prolonged period of time? Can we use them for a week, a month? What is? Very good question, Councilmember Diep. Um, so um, to follow with Dave's uh, comment, uh, we do have a preventative maintenance program as well. So our emergency generators, <clears throat> they're checked monthly to ensure that they uh, do operate correctly. Uh, we do ensure uh, what the fuel levels are and top those off to the point where it is not all the way full. We have to leave some room for expansion of the fuel, uh, but we keep them as, as full as possible, just ready to go for an emergency. Um, the runtime depends on what emergency loads are connected to the generator and those electrical draws. Uh, so for example, as mentioned earlier, the city hall generator, we can sustain 17 hours of operation until the fuel supply is depleted. Obviously, we're gonna build in a plan where we will refuel as we go along, so it will never be all the way depleted, uh, but for 17 hours for the existing connected load. Uh, the existing connected load is for the essential equipment within City Hall as well too, so it cannot power all of the aspects. We will lose some lighting, some PCs, uh, things of that nature, but the access control, the security functions, uh, emergency lighting, the network operations center, those will still run uh, as planned. Um, for some of the smaller sites, it, it really depends. Those generators could be very small. Um, our garage locations that are between eight to 10 hours of operation, and we are also looking at scaled back operations as well too. So for those pieces of equipment that we don't need, uh, taking those maybe offline or restricting the usage to prolong the fuel that's inside those generators. Uh, but it really depends on site conditions, uh, site usage, and then the size of the, uh, the backup generator and the fueling capacity. And I would add to that, we're 
working with departments to determine what are the critical functions they have to keep going and ensuring that we have the power to supply them and then shutting down other operations. So we're not going to keep every city function operating. It's the critical functions that have to keep going and that can reduce the demand for the energy to kind of prolong the kind of fuel and, and the backup power capability and extend its life. And, and is our, going off that, what you just told me, um, is our city hall built or in a way that we can um, prioritize function A, B, and C and then like flip the switch and shut everything else down? Or would we have to go floor by floor and just say, you know, turn off this PC so you're not drawing from the 17 hour supply source? Uh, City Hall, uh, the electrical connection is already structured in that fashion where we've already identified uh, those critical circuits, those critical electrical panels that must be connected to the emergency uh, generator. Um, there's been some discussion on whether we need to connect more equipment uh, to those emergency panels that connect to the emergency generator uh, just to keep essential critical functions at City Hall running as well too. We can. Uh, that will deplete the fuel a little bit faster, uh, but we can engage into a strategy where we refuel uh, at, at a higher frequency. Okay. And I know this is an emergency study session, but since we're on this topic, in the case of you know Katrina type event, um, and the feds come in or the state nat national guard or the states uh, come in, is there already a protocol in place where they know you know they can interface with our grid or to do whatever they need to do or? Um, is there going to have to be a briefing of some sort or is there like, I don't know, like a, a master key, master steps where they just go into any city or any state and that protocol is already there? That's, that's done through the emergency operations center, the coordination link and bringing out those outside resources. Kip mentioned the mutual aid resources, same thing, with, that's a coordination point. So the federal government and the state government just can't come in and start operating because they, they have to have that interface and that coordination link. Uh, to provide us with resources as they come in. Okay. Um, sh shifting over to batteries, I, the, one of the, the first things Amir said, and I tend to agree, uh, is, is I think the, the potential of storing energy um, is preferable, in my opinion, to having a, a backup generator if we could, you know, pick between the two. But my understanding is the battery technology at, at this point um, is still in development to a phase where we can't necessarily rely on it because I think we can store energy but holding the charge is the issue is that right yeah so that technology um, is developing it has improved somewhat and I I would say for a backup generation I think it's there but what that means is you have to install a larger battery so instead of just different hour durations um, typically you know some batteries have been sized at the four hour dur duration and that may not be sufficient for backup and, and to provide resiliency so we're probably looking more at an eight hour duration battery or longer and so what that means is that it's just a larger battery and so it's likely going to be somewhat more um, expensive but, but in terms of with a battery like if you have you charge your phone 100 percent you never use it the battery's going to deplete even if it's not being used so i guess that's the yeah yeah that's a great point I, I'm I'm happy to answer that so um, you know how these solar plus storage systems would operate is that it's important um, that they would be operating actually continuously so so you wouldn't only start to rely on that battery during an emergency event um, you would use it often with on-site solar to shift that generation later in the day so you're discharging the battery at night and you're not drawing the same amount of energy from the utility grid at night. So, so it would be used um, to, to address that issue. Okay, well, that's all for me. Thank you so much for bringing this to, to at least my attention. It's not something that I would think about, but for these sort of study sessions, so thank you. Thanks, I, I know we're still trying to figure this out, but just to follow up on, on the questions, the council, questions of Councilmember Yep. Um, I would assume that if we were to go a solar storage approach, um, that we would use the storage f to address intermittency challenges on a daily basis, but perhaps during a red flag type conditions, we then say, okay, halt usage of the battery and let's just use it for storage um, in case someone pulls the plug. Is, is that possible? I think it's possible. I think we'd have to work with the manufacturers and, you know, obviously a, a design and engineering team to make sure that that's possible to operate that way. Um, 
One of the challenges with the red flag conditions, and I'll, I'll let Ray expand on this more, but they, um, you know, my understanding, they can occur all the way from May through November, so it's a, it's a large period of the year, and just making sure that, that we're planning through those operations when we get those warnings. Um, I, I think one challenge might be that pg e has said that we may not get any warning, and so that's where we'd have to think about the operation of the battery that to ensure that it's charged in the event that this happened and we had less than 24 hours notice. Right. Uh, yes, uh, on the red flag conditions, um, the anticipation is that we'll, we will have 48 hours in notification ahead of time because they can predict a lot of that. But in the situation that occurred in, in June of this year up in the Napa area, uh, they had a four hour window of notification. So that does, it does vary. And we've been fortunate this year not to have a red flag warning yet, knock on wood, but uh, this, by this time last year we had already had several, so yeah. uh, it does carry on through November. And we also have to pay attention that this is not just about hot weather. This can also happen during the cold weather, during the winter, uh, when high winds take place and they can be doing power shutoffs then as well. Uh, and so this becomes now an annual or a year-long program, not just during the, the heat events. Well, that's uh, depressing. Thank you. <laughs> Helpful information, though. Um, you know, I know that when in Sacramento there was a lot of discussion around how PG&E has the ability with regard to their transmission lines to isolate shutdowns for on, on dedicated segments so they can de-energize a segment and continue to run the transmission line uh, forward from where it's uh, de-energized. And I'm just wondering, is there much hope uh, for the feasibility in which if a transmission line does get shut down, you could still essentially isolate that and keep distribution lines going in a local area while the transmission line shut down? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the, the California Independent System Operator in collaboration with the utilities and local entities are doing a lot of modeling around that. And, and that is really the, the ISO's job is to ensure that there's reliable power available. So you might imagine there's transmission lines that go down for maintenance all of the time. And you know those transmission owners submit those outage requests to the ISO. Now, if it's planned maintenance, the ISO might deny that because they might say, no, we need that transmission line to provide reliable power. If it's a forced outage and they need to take it out, then the ISO has a lot of engineers and modeling experts to figure out what lines they can reroute power to. And so we've been working pretty closely with them. And I think in most situations, they do think that they can rebalance the system. However, one thing that caught all of our attention, and the ISO put out a study pretty recently around, there was a, um, an event in July where there was a fire up near the California-Oregon border where there's a large inner tie on the transmission line where we import power from the Pacific Northwest. They de-energized that line. That, that's a, a, a very high voltage 500 kV line where we import a lot of power, and so, um, you know, ultimately they were able to rebalance the system, but their engineers did a lot of modeling that they concluded that if that happened again, where they needed to take down the inner tie on the California-Oregon border, and potentially there was also an outage, for example, the, the scenario that they looked at was Diablo Canyon, which is the big nuclear power plant. Um, if there was a fire located there and that um, unit got de-energized, in that case, they would need to curtail over 2,000 megawatts of load throughout the state. And, um, you know, they are putting together plans of how they would need to do that, but that might look like rolling blackouts, which right. many of us lived through in the early 2000s, where um, it, it absolutely isn't great. You know, what happens in that case is that uh, certain... Um, cities would go through periods of time where, where the, the power is essentially shut down. I would say that the benefit of that is, is that we definitely would prefer that situation over a cascading outage, which is uncontrolled and takes down large portions of the transmission system. So I would say, at least on the positive front, the ISO is getting in front of that and, and running through scenarios of what potentially could happen with the transmission lines and how they would handle that to prevent a cascading outage. 
Thank you, Laurie. Um, I know we didn't talk about it much today, but it was in the report, the fuel cells, and I know we've been exploring that a little bit. We've got a local company here just moved their headquarters in Bloom. Um, and I understand, you know, we made the comparison of the GHG profile of, um, of a fuel cell versus PG&E provided power. I understand it's not favorable, but relative to a backup generator, which uses natural gas or diesel, I assume it would be favorable. Is that, is that fair? Um, so a, a fuel cell also uses natural gas. I think the right. benefit would be if it used diesel or propane. Natural gas is obviously cleaner than diesel, and so there would be right. some benefit there. Right. And I, I thought it was somehow more efficiently using the gas. Am I wrong about that? No, you're right. Cell? You're okay. right. That, that's an additional benefit. So, and I, and I recall during the conversations, because I know you guys have been in conversation with Bloom, that there may be technological advances happening in the next year or two that may make may improve the profile of these these fuel cells. Is that right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the timeline of that, but in general, the fuel cell technology has been around many years, um, you know, more than 20 as long as I've been in the energy um, business. But um, you know, there is this concept of using potentially solar energy to split water into hydrogen and then oxygen as a byproduct, and that could be a clean fuel source for a fuel cell instead of using natural gas, um, which is primarily how most fuel cells are deployed now. And so I, th I think that might be an option as that technology matures and, and um, potentially becomes commercially available. And so that's something that we could potentially look at. Okay. Putting that aside then just for the moment, as, as we look at fuel cells today, do they provide at all a viable option or alternative to us to generation, um, backup generation? Because I'm just, I'm getting more and more worried about the prospect relying on backup generators. Again, knowing the great uncertainties of whether or not fuel will even get to the site. Um, in terms of cost and feasibility, is that a, is that a decent option? Um, I, I don't think we've evaluated the cost of the fuel cells yet. That's certainly something we could look into. Um, okay. I, I, I think, you know, some of the challenges that we identified um, were just the emissions profile and, and, you know, the reliance on natural gas, but we could certainly look into that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then finally, just around um, individual homeowners and on-site resilience. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, certainly, in the, in the, in the report about this. And, and there are lots of solar, I think we have the third largest or most widespread solar deployment of any city in the country. So we've got a lot of residents that are using solar and we'd love to see more doing it. Um, and as I recall, there's some kind of infrastructure that's needed for f folks uh, use, relying on solar to actually be able to get off the grid <laughs> in the case of a, of a de-energization event. Can you describe roughly what that is and what the cost of that is if you were to combine that infrastructure with a battery? What does that look like for a homeowner? Is that even feasible? Yeah, it's a great question. I can, I can answer some of that. So typically, um, when you put solar on your house or you put in a, also a battery storage, typically you're grid connected. So what a lot of people sometimes don't understand is that when the grid goes down, even though their solar is generating, it, it does not supply power to the house. And there, there's reasons for that. The main reason is that the utility does not want that energy to backflow onto their system. So if they've de-energized because they have an issue on the distribution infrastructure that they need to repair, it's dangerous to have electricity flowing back onto the system. And so typically what happens is um, the power is without power. Now, to get around that, um, there are some new installations that are going in which have the ability to island. That's a concept that we've talked about where um, if the, the utility grid goes down, the home, the solar energy can still power part of the home, but there's a lot of electrical infrastructure um, that needs to be included for a homeowner to look at that option, and the costs vary depending on the size of the home and, and what infrastructure needs to get installed. And so that is an area where we could help, uh, certainly among um, educating about how solar technology works and how solar... Uh, excuse me, storage technology works 
in terms of um, you know making sure customers are thinking through this as they put solar energy on their home. Up until now, the main reason people put solar energy on their home, obviously, was to invest in cleaner options, but then to reduce the energy that they're using from the utility grid and to get those economic benefits. Um, but obviously now there's, there's new resiliency benefits that um, I think a lot of education needs to be done around how that works and working with our local contractor to make sure it's installed and configured to, to allow that if that's important for them. Do you just have a rough order of magnitude of what that costs a typical homeowner? I don't. Unfortunately, okay. I think it would be, as we've talked about before, it's so site-specific. Yeah. It really depends on the age of the home, how old it is, the size, yeah. all of that. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Uh, well, this has been really, uh, really helpful, uh, and I hope uh, my colleagues agree that uh, this is certainly critical for us to, to understand more deeply. Uh, I don't have any cards, but I see Mr. Beekman running down, so why don't you come on down and, and offer your public comment, and then you can fill out a card on your way out. Great. Mayor, if I can make a comment, too. Yes, Jim. Include a, we've covered a wide range of topics yes. today, uh, really unfunded projects as well, so yeah. I think we really need to kind of do follow-up in terms of focusing on what are the initiatives we're really going to take to the level of making them operational, you know, what's feasible, what's operational, and we're going to need some investment around that. So I think yeah. I just want to be up front that this team did an amazing job kind of over this 10-week period of pulling all this together. But it's important now that we really focus our proposals and advance the things that we, you know, we heard from the council today what's important. So we'll be doing that. But there's going to need to be some investment around making these a reality. Yeah, a fair point. And certainly that investment means more people or consultants or someone who That's can right. do an awful lot of this uh, research and 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 heavy lifting. So I, I get it. Uh, folks have worked very hard to get us to this point, and we're going to need to make decisions about really where we go deeper uh, because we can't do it all. Yeah, we'll continue to, to use these resources to focus in on what's the smartest investment that we can do. So we'll be bringing, you know, putting that together and bringing back that back to the council at the right time. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Welcome, Blair. Thank you. Uh, to add to what was just spoken, uh, look up the federal Bay Uwasi website. It is doing important work in the in Bay Area emergency preparedness with the agency SF card. Uh, you should all be aware of. Um, to offer my uh, uh, speech here. I have always been impressed with uh, the honest efforts of the Clean Energy Community Advisory Commission. It has been talked about in the Bay Area for a few years now that the city government commission process itself could be a part of an important cause of how to reintroduce and work as a friendly go-between for people and their government. PG&E seems to have developed practices of death and in how to create a future of social infrastructure and social change. I feel in San Jose, we are becoming more aware how we can learn from this and what is hopefully becoming its mistaken backward logic of social engineering. I feel local, San Jose, local energy ideas uh, work towards good ideas of the environment and democracy and that can allow for strong local voices that can work to be sure no one will be harmed or even left fearful of their local government. I hope everyone in the community can really consider there are several programs that can offer a simple positive good for the future of San Jose at this time. In the remaining time to use uh, my own positive voice in what I feel the community energy program can be about, important activists are being killed in Honduras to make sure dams can be built to eventually send electricity to the U.S. I hope people of San Jose will consider this and not want to buy Honduran electricity in the future. To also note, San Jose Local Energy uh, also wants to fully leave natural gas or fracked gas with a possible economic disruption process based on fracked and natural gas. San Jose is, line, is lining itself up to be with people, businesses, and ideas whose moral arc is working towards a more positive future. Thank you for this. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Uh, thank you uh, again to everyone who worked so hard to get us here. I know we'll be uh, continuing these conversations, and I believe the next steps, Jim, I assume staff is going to be <clears throat> bringing back some suggestions about on the short and medium term where we're going to be investing our, our resources. That's right, Mayor. Okay, great. Yep. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Needs adjourned.